miss the time slot. That's what it seems like. And what she just got off the call, so maybe she'll rejoin us, perhaps? With her radio station. So you mean we only had an hour? That's what it's on on the broadcast. The, but I think she would have left it on her channel for like I anyone see. who else was interested. Yeah. I, I that's see. what it, it looks like. That's what they were going for. Okay. Uh, so Aristides, thanks for joining us. Uh, basically, uh, what happened was that uh, um, she was attacked uh, and they shut uh -huh. her down. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, it, wow. it's like uh, we figured that, uh, you know, we might as well make a short call, you know, recording of our own thing and maybe she'll rejoin us. Uh, and uh, it's it was a nightmare. Yeah, just just uh, it's meant to demoralize, of course, meant to uh, uh, dissuade and discourage uh, this sort of thing from ever happening again. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, all I can say is that uh, the people in the chat were uh, definitely responsible for it. Um, uh, they, they uh, you know, were complaining about Buzz while she was talking, but she wasn't going to say much anyway. And it was just going to allow me to talk and I sounded fine. So they were the third thing to fuck it up. But uh, in the end, they shut down everything anyway. So it, it's, there were, you know, it, there are so many factors. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I, I just don't know what to say. Uh, of course, if she comes back on, we can do our own little uh, interview privately and upload it onto our respective YouTube channels. Um, so uh, that's the uh, nature of it uh, in general. Um, so I'm recording this call. Uh, we'll just uh, upload it up onto YouTube and it'll be a special little like, uh, you know, explanation for what happened. And uh, it, it's just an ongoing nightmare with this sort of thing. Um, and hopefully she's resilient enough where she rebounds and uh, does continue coming on my show. And then ultimately we'll uh, try and make it work again. And uh, this time we'll make it happen just by preparing for hours beforehand uh, rather than, uh, you know, it, she, of course, wanted to kind of just start into it. And she felt pretty confident. She seemed pretty confident that she had it. Looks like um, she rescheduled the, the live stream. OK, there. So maybe there's, she's hoping. Okay. She's, there's a thing up. Looks like it, it says, uploaded. Yeah, it says live in 22 minutes. Turned okay. on subscribers only mode. So that's what it's. There she is. Is there any okay. audio? Yeah, we've got your well, audio. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, now let's just one second. Yeah. Okay, now yes, honey. I'm going to do one thing real quick. One second. Take your time, darling. None of us are going anywhere. Right, I'm seeing a thing on her channel, but it looks like it was an entire day ago. That's that's your David Lewis Anderson time travel. Yeah. Yeah. First, <laughs> first, first conversation meeting with Douglas Dietrich and Prelude interview. Dayton. Yeah. 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 That's where Dayton. she recorded. That's where she recorded a Skype conversation and uploaded it. OK. Yeah. Now, yes, honey. Um, let somebody check YouTube. I created. Well, hang on a minute. Yeah. Um, let me check here. Check it now, 
and see. So my check there when you get a Aristides, chance. Aristides, Brendan, um, you gentlemen. Aristides, now. It's running. Yeah. It's running great. The live stream's running. We can hear all of us, and the Skype call is live. So you guys proceed. Oh, there it is. Okay, and I'm recording uh, on my end. Okay. My lord. So, honey, are you working tomorrow? Um, yeah, but that's oh, okay. You're kidding. Oh, Jesus. What oh, time? but it's fine. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It's not okay. a big deal. So okay, let's can... just let's just settle in here for a minute and get you our bet. bearings. Yeah. I want you to know I think you're the most diligent, resilient, uh, courageous young lady on earth. I mean, honestly, you know, this was an attack. Uh, it was an attack in which they did what was supposed to be technically impossible, and they shut down things on your end and basically a lot of different ends. And this is done to discourage us from ever doing this. This, this is what was, they do. This was stressful. I was yeah. just like, oh my gosh, I don't know why it's doing it now. It had no problem yesterday, but now it seems yeah. to be working fine, I think. And as long as everything's running smoothly. So so our impression, Brendan Zogit, uh, his impression was that we were stuck to a one hour time slot with the radio station and that they kind of had to um, have you come on and do a little something and then usher you out at the end of the time slot. Is, was that the case? No, okay. no, there's no limit on it at all. Oh, good. So I actually spoke with him. He helped me kind of reset my audio and everything's cool. Excellent. Okay. I'm just getting my bearings again so we can get right back in the zone. Absolutely. So I hope everybody will just bear with us for a minute. I mean, I'm I, I'm so sorry that we're having these kind of technical issues, but we'll get right into it. Um, I'll turn my camera on in here here in a second. Um, I, I want all our listeners to know that none of this is Jennifer Hawkins's fault. All of this is an attack that happens to anyone who's sincerely trying to interview me. What we can conclude at this point is that Jennifer is not on the side of the enemy. The way she suffered tonight, uh, they truly fear her interviewing me. So, uh, by all means, um, okay. back to Jen. Let's settle in. Here we go. I'm going to turn my camera on. It shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Oh. I double clicked it. <laughs> so You're beautiful. Okay. Now, <laughs> let's, let's get stunning. into this. Let's get in. Thank you. You look wonderful this evening. Thank you. You're very kind. Okay. So, now... Um, you're listening to Jen Arcana on KUAP Troubled Minds Radio Network. Today we're um, visiting with Mr. Douglas Dietrich. He is the former research librarian for the Department of Defense. I wanted to talk. The reason I'm even here is because he was so kind. I got a hold of him through his live stream on his channel, which I'm going to link that in the description afterwards when I do some editing um, with the. Uh, you know, putting the radio connection through there and then also Mr. Dietrich's channel. He also has a website and he's written some books and we'll get into that a little bit too, if you'd like, because that'd be wonderful for you to plug some of your books. Thank you. And could you please, Mr. Dietrich, um, tell the listeners a little bit about your early days in the military and how it began that you began to notice, I think you are familiar, um, Michael Aquino, Yes. is um, going to play prominently in this interview, as well as the Presidio case, Satanism in the military, yeah. his experience of that. Um, and then we'll go from there. What we're going to start with is what he, um, his experience when he was starting out as the librarian for the Department of Defense. And just please give us a nice run through of your experience with that, please. Yes. Thank you so much. First thing I'd like to ask is our dear friend Aristides, the material science engineer, um, leave the call so that we can have a half and half visually <laughs> since we are recording this. We love you dearly, Aristides, <laughs> but uh, let's have you. Uh... Oh, no, no, I, no problem. I appreciate you calling me your time of crisis. Um, all right, I'll let you go and I'll keep an eye on it. Thank you. Bless you. Uh, then, of course, Brendan joins so that uh, uh, and, uh, um, so Brendan, is there something you want to say before you leave the call uh, visually? Uh, <laughs> we're back. Good. Now okay. we've got half and half. 
and we can get started. These were helpful friends of ours, and uh, they're like little imps. You have to kind of, uh, it, you know, it all works out. So I want uh, our lovely uh, Jennifer Hawkins to know something that uh, I'm, I'm going to go into how uh, all of it started is basically is kind of like uh, goes into um, my childhood. It, 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 uh, it goes into the military background, starts before I was born. Uh, so I want everyone to understand that uh, my father was in the Navy uh, for over 30 years. He is the man who raised and guided me. Um, he uh, almost certainly is not my biological father. Uh, this is George Joseph Henry Dietrich. He was a chief petty officer of the United States Navy. Uh, is that, uh, honey, you, you had kind of raised your hand like you wanted to ask a question? Was there something no, there? I was going to move this and I decided oh, okay. not to touch anything. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, understood. So uh, what happened was that my uh, the man who raised and guided me uh, ran away from um, Eastman Kodak, uh, in a sense. He ran away from his own family, which was heavily involved with Eastman Kodak, which was a defense contract company that had uh, enormous influence in the world uh, at that time, uh, was the high-tech company of its day and uh, was very much in control of Rochester, New York, certainly uh, to the point where they were able to segment off a huge amount of Rochester, New York. All of this is relevant to how I ultimately wound up working with Michael Aquino, believe it or not. Um, so it does bear retelling and does bear explaining and gives everyone kind of a uh, the essence of um, how things evolved, um, how I became the person I became that was so attractive to Michael Aquino. Um, so um, my mother uh, was in Asia at the time uh, and she had her own backstory. Uh, in the case of my father, however, it, it's more immediately relevant. Um, so uh, when it came to uh, the Kodak company, George Eastman developed uh, film development technology that was unprecedented. And oh, wow. he developed, yes, yes, yeah. And so what he did was that um, he was ultimately impacted by this technology. Uh, he worked with heavily with chemicals and they wound up poisoning him systemically to the point where he suffered from uh, basically a diseased nervous system. He was chronically in pain and then ultimately George Eastman killed himself. Uh, but because of the extreme pain he was in. Before he killed himself, one of the few things keeping him alive was that he was trying to change the world, revolutionize it as he had uh, technologically uh, by uh, basically uh, introducing a new calendrical system. And so what he did was he developed his own calendar, what he believed would be a universal business calendar. And this universal business calendar was uh, something that had a certain number of months uh, that were almost metric in nature. So all the months had an even number of days. And uh, this was something that he felt would be a calendar system that all businesses would use so that all businesses would be on the same time frame and uh, this would render universal business uh, possible or, or have it enter a new phase of evolution. Uh, when he presented this to the League of Nations at that time, the precursor to the United Nations after World War I, uh, they did not uh, buy into his idea. And it was shortly after that that he killed himself. But it's important to remember that his control over his own corporate culture was so extreme that that calendar was used within that Kodak company culture. So when uh, he developed his own uh, company town that was part of Rochester, New York, but definitely separated from it, he had it fenced off with razor wire, electrified fencing, and behind that razor wire and electrified fencing was an entire city. We're talking about a Ferris wheels and amusement park so the kids would not have to go to amusement parks outside. We're talking about its own hospital system so that all the people who were injured in various chemical burns, various chemical explosions, wouldn't have to leave the Kodak company town. They'd be treated in the hospital there by hospital employees. Mm -hmm. And the reason that this was important to him was because he was not following the federal safety standards for industrial procedures or processing. So this way he uh, had his own mini nation state. Uh, okay. 
and it had its own uh, energy source, its own dynamo system big enough to power an entire city. It was all its own energy system, its own water supply. We're talking about it was its own little world. So when I worked as a Department of Defense librarian, one of the things that I would notice on uh, blueprints concerning uh, bomb site lenses, uh, sniper scope lenses developed by Kodak Company was they would say this product was made on Kodak Company time. And what they literally meant was you would have to consult their calendar and then cross-reference it with yours to find out when it was made and how long uh, time span it took to make it on your time. So, yeah. yeah. So this is all important because uh, I killed my grandfather. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, what had happened was my father's father, who had worked at Kodak forever, was poisoned by all of those chemicals, just like George Eastman was. And it okay. rendered him... Insane. I've heard of that actually with the yeah. go ahead. Yes. And just so people understand the gravity of the situation, and how real it is, Rochester Medical University um, has had to deal with a phenomenon where because Rochester's uh, entire water supply has been poisoned by Kodak, Kodak Company chemicals, wow. Kodak used to produce enormous amounts of color separately. Each color was copyrighted. And so when they would dump these colors into the river, one part of the river would be pure green, another pure red, another pure blue, uh, another pure yellow. And then they would take these bleed off toxic chemicals and they would pay all the local farmers to bury it in their backyards. They would pay them good money not to ask questions, to keep that their mouths shut. crazy. Yes. And That's so what happened? But yeah. As it is. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It all got into the water table and it all poisoned everybody in all over upstate New York, but particularly Rochester. And so Rochester Medical University deals with a congenital deformity based on this that they call Rochester dick. This is not, of course, the medical term for it, but basically men are born in Rochester whose penises are right next to their anuses, exactly in the position that a woman's vagina would be. And wow. uh, as a result, this is common because of the chemical poisoning. Um, there was that factor that caused my, my father, um, the man who raised and guided me to run away and join the Navy. And there was also the factor that his father, driven insane by chemicals, was extraordinarily abusive. Uh, one of the things that happened was he had like maybe seven other boys with my father's mother, but my father, I'll say my legal father, my legal father's mother gave birth to at least seven other boys for this man who was my legal grandfather. And uh, she um, had the last boy was the man who raised and guided me, George Joseph Henry Dietrich. He was the only one named George. All of the rest of the brothers were named William after Kaiser Wilhelm. And uh, but he was born last and the uh, his his father said, this guy's the runt of the litter. And he told my father's mother, you can have him, you raise him. And so my father was essentially raised differently than all the other boys in the family. There was one girl that was born, the mm -hmm. eighth or ninth child. And my grandfather, legal grandfather, broke both her legs so she could not run away while he was raping her. Uh, oh, all of this, gosh, wow. you know, all of this is important because it's almost certain. Well, I was told later on, decades later, decades later, by members of the Dietrich family, that um, he was part of a satanic cult, and ultimately, this cult was connected to the cult of Michael Aquino. So there was already that connection. And uh, in other words, Michael Aquino was made aware of myself through my grandfather. Now, the re reason he was made aware of myself through my grandfather was, as I said, I killed him. Ultimately, uh, what had happened was when um, the Vietnam War was ending, winding down, uh, my father had the great misfortune of serving on a couple of ships that suffered terribly during the Vietnam War. One of them was the USS Forrestal, uh, and it caught on fire. There was a terrible uh, amount of death. Um, my father was a uh, part of the rescue uh, attempts in that ship uh, carrier. My father was a carrier sailor for the most uh, most of the time during his career. Uh, he originally started in the gunboat patrols in mainland China before World War II because he had joined the Navy when he was so young. He ran away when he was 15, 16 years old. Uh, they took him because they would take young boys in those days. As a matter of fact, they were desperate for personnel 
because, believe it or not, at that time in history, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was conducting a crackdown on homosexuality in the Navy. And because he was conducting a crackdown on homosexuality in the Navy, uh, what had happened was that he uh, um, convinced sailors to seduce other sailors and then turn them in. Uh, espionage in the Navy. By the way, Nemo, thank you for joining us. I'll have to ask you to leave the call because we're conducting a, a genuine interview now with Jennifer Hawkins. So we want this to be split it's screen. Fine, but yes, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Nemo. And uh, so when it comes to uh, what had happened with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and what he was doing, uh, they had gotten rid of so many naval personnel. And what they would do is when sailors were discovered in coitus on ships, they would do the same thing generally is they would uh, drop them off at the San Francisco. And this was how San Francisco gradually became gay, was they gradually dumped so many gay sailors in San Francisco uh, that they became the mecca of a new community, a new subculture. And because uh, they were already busted for being gay and unemployable elsewhere. And therefore, they created their own community in San Francisco. That's how all that got started. Uh, in the case of my father, when he ran away from home and joined the Navy, uh, they were so desperate for manpower at that time because Roosevelt was purging all these gays. And the Navy was full of gays because men on ships with nothing else to do wind up uh, usually having well, sex with each other. <laughs> and oh, yeah. so, so when my father joined the Navy, the first thing they did with him was they said, uh, are you gay? And he said, no. And uh, the doctor said, we're going to prove it. We're going to find out. And he shoved a dildo down his throat. And when my father gagged and his eyes bulged out and he had tears streaming down his face, then the doctor said, see, you're not gay. We'll, yeah. we'll take you. He okay. says they were so desperate they took him because he was um, he's only 16, but they allowed him in. And so when he joined the Navy at that time, uh, when the Vietnam War was over, he had married uh, my mother at that point. And there's a very important story to be brought in here. At that time, it's very important for Americans to understand because I don't think Americans really appreciate the kind of world that they live in is not the world that I was born in. Uh, the I was born in 1966 yes. and it, I was born right after the legalization of hybrid marriages. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't be legalized until the year after I was born. It's one of the reasons we didn't come to the United States until I was three years old. Uh, but uh, there was a law in the United States against interracial marriage. And uh, so a man who married a wife overseas, especially someone who was not white and uh, were bringing a child, they legally could not do that, legally couldn't bring the child into the US. Wow. That was, uh, synonymous with another law that was a uniform code of military justice law, a military code law, where they said that because they were fighting in Japan, Korea, Vietnam, they said, we don't know who the enemy is, but we know they're all Asian. And because of that, no American serviceman was allowed to marry an Asian woman. It was against the law or rather the military code. And so what happened was they made a movie about this starring Marlon Brando, number of other actors called Sayonara, where they showed all the lovers' suicides. And because they presented this to the public, the public uh, developed a sense of uh, remorse. And uh, then uh, my father, along with multiple other servicemen, was part of a class action lawsuit to sue the US military so that they could marry their Asian war brides. And uh, the uh, Supreme Court of the United States overturned the Uniform Code of Military Justice as unconstitutional in that regard. Uh, it's only because of these reasons I was allowed to even come to the United States. So I was born in Taiwan as a Taiwanese national, but uh, because my father was a U.S. serviceman, I was then declared legally a U.S. citizen by naturalization. So I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen. So when we were brought over to the United States, my mother was already rather infamous uh, in intelligence circles because she had been a translator uh, at the diplomatic level throughout World War II. So there was an understanding of who my mother was, and she One, was under. Yes. Mr. Dietrich. Yeah. I want. I'd like. It would be nice if Nemo could. Um, oh yes, to... Nemo. Um, yes, if you could. Um, it said he left the call, but for some reason his his um, symbol's not disappearing, and I wish I knew how to make it disappear. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's, then go let's ahead. Let's try this. Okay, remove from call. There we go. 
And, uh, there we did, go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, our man, uh, uh, um, shall we say, uh, well, what happened after that was my father thought he could get back into the family will. And he thought he could do that by being a care provider for my grandfather. When he brought me and my mother over to the United States, we went to upstate New York to care for his father in his retirement. None of the other children were doing that. And so my father thought by being the only young son who was the care provider, he would get into the will. And so unfortunately, because of his insanity, um, my grandfather and likely his Satanism, my grandfather basically um, was beyond abusive. When as soon as um, my can mother. I ask a, can I ask yeah. you a question? Of course. I wonder how your grandfather got into to being a part of the Satanism, too. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, you know, this it, goes way back, doesn't it? It seems to be a family lineage thing. Yes, yes. Definitely. It um, it definitely I would say that uh, it was probably through um, Kodak Company, probably defense contracts, some kind of uh, Kodak Company was obviously um, a very uh, it, it was it was different from your average company, obviously. And Eastman Kodak um, may have had um, a, a way of keeping people out of unions was probably by getting them involved in the cult instead. It's what makes sense. Uh, make sense. Yeah, because if everyone were involved with a kind of anti-church, then uh, mm -hmm. they would not be going to the conventional churches and exposing themselves to a lifestyle outside of the company. Mm -hmm. This is what um, I understood to have happened. Um, certainly what my own, the man who raised and guided me, my legal father intuited. Um, when it came to his bringing my sister, myself, and my mother into Walcott, New York, the home of this uh, individual, my grandfather, uh, to give you an idea of how isolated it is, um, one young lady who lived in Albany, New York, told myself um, that she would love to check on my parents' gravestone in upstate New York because my father served in three wars. He's got a headstone provided by the Veterans Administration that shows three wars, uh, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, my gang stalkers have threatened to destroy that headstone. Uh, so I've always asked people if there's someone who could check on my father's headstone in upstate New York. But this one young lady called me from Albany and said, you know, I, I really would like to do that. But she told me it would be easier for her to actually get in her car, drive to the New York airport, and take a plane to see me in San Francisco than it would be for her to drive to Walcott, New York. That's how isolated Walcott, New York is. Okay. So it's really out in the middle of nowhere. And I found that out, of course, when I buried my parents there. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it came to um, when we were children, we were up there with this deranged man. And one of the things that would happen is my mother would go shopping with my father in the town. They'd bring home enough things in bulk for both children. They'd bring mm -hmm. home multiple loaves of bread, buckets of ice cream. He would eat it all in a one night. He would devour entire buckets of ice cream, entire loaves of bread and vomit it out and then eat mm -hmm. the rest saying everything in this house is mine. Everything in this house belongs to me. And he felt that about us. So he proceeded to begin attempting to rape my sister. And mainly because my mother, this is very Japanese and people may not understand this culture. So it needs a, just a little bit of explaining. If you ever take a look at the Kabuki theater and they show the ancient Japanese samurai cultural system, they'll mm -hmm. show for instance, the typical thing that would also happen in China and anywhere else when uh, a royal family loses a war, the other family will come in and massacre all the heirs so that they can't have a claim to the throne. And what they'll show is in the samurai culture, uh, when the enemy is looking for who is the heir to the throne, what would happen is uh, most samurai women would throw their own children forward and say, this is the heir to the throne so that they would be killed instead of the real heir. That's uh, the sense of samurai. Crazy loyalty yeah. well it's it's a culture it's a different culture yeah. and um in the case of my mother because she didn't want me to be 
despoiled or desecrated by this individual, she would throw my sister in front of him to rape. And that was essentially my sister would suffer this uh, offense for the early part of her life. Obviously, this scarred her for the rest of her life. Um, when he finally attempted to rape myself orally, my mm -hmm. teeth were just coming in and I bit his penis off. Mm -hmm. And I remember this was my first conscious memory. Now, I was three years old. I was three years old. My teeth were just coming in. And the only thing I remember is blood's got to taste better than this was just it tasted like turpentine right it tasted like turpentine it's a i remember peter moon said kodak blood and mm -hmm. it's not inappropriate that's uh essentially what happened with that now we were told he was dying and uh the police uh told uh my parents you'd better get out of upstate new york immediately because the town hated us anyway they mm -hmm. hated us because um my father had come home with an asian bride and um, she was hated enough where no one in the town would sell her anything. If she would always have to go in with my father in order to purchase anything, no one would uh, deal with her. Uh, and so they were literally coming to burn the house down with us in it. Um, so we left immediately and my father took us to San Francisco. That's how I wound up in San Francisco. And the reason he came here, several reasons. One was obviously it's the opposite end of the continent and also it was where the Presidio military base was. And as a military veteran, that meant he had access to the base for shopping, for hospital care, and that all of us did as well because we were his military family, his his dependents. It's called a military dependent system until right. you turn 18. Yeah. And so what happened was uh, we were told, uh, you know, basically the police told us that my grandfather was dying and we simply accepted that. It wasn't until years later. I found out he had survived and lingered for a few more years, but he ultimately died. And mm -hmm. this is what uh, everyone else, all the other children came in to take care of him while he was on life support for a number of years. And they all got in the will and he basically then died. Uh, but um, because in those days there was no Internet and mm -hmm. they were not calling us or talking to us. Uh, we had no way of knowing that he was alive. The, there was nothing in the papers and uh, we thought they had covered it up in secret because of the nature of his death. So it, it just, just goes to show there's also a time lag, a difference between the date of his death and uh, the date of his death because he died on Kodak company time. So there's right. still a mystery That's as to exactly yeah. Um, yeah, when he died. Still a mystery as to exactly when he died. And um, so, but um, with all that being said, that gives you okay. some idea of how Aquino had heard of me because Aquino later related to me, he had heard about what I had done to my grandfather. And so apparently the satanic network reported to him and he was watching me like a hawk from that point forward. Now, this becomes key to how I wound up working and liaising with Michael Aquino. He knew about my mother's work in Asia. He knew about my killing my grandfather which ultimately i did and he knew about uh what had happened with um a number of other things along the way i certainly know i was monitored mm. while i was growing up mm. one of the things that would happen all the while i was growing up is strangers would call on the telephone and they would conduct surveys surveys mm. and of course i i uh, i would just be anxious to talk to people happy to talk to people but who would conduct surveys with a child who's like nine, eight, 10, 11 years so old? They would around. call on the, they'd call on the, you hear me okay, right? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So they would call on the phone. Yeah. And just kind of, you'd pick up the phone. Would they ask for you or you're the one who answered the phone? It was just I would be the one to answer the phone because oftentimes my parents were gone. My father took years to overcome his alcoholism and my mother was usually working or out um, for lack of a better word. Um, we can get into that another time. She had other activities, uh, not prostituting herself. I assure anyone, not that I would judge any anything negative about that. If that right. was what she had done, I would be open about it. But that's not what she was doing. Uh, right. But some other time as to exactly what she was doing. Uh, but she, my parents were just she wasn't hardly home, but she were home and the phone yeah. would ring. How old were you, do you think? Oh, literally, it started when I was seven years old, at least, maybe six. And, of course, I'd pick up the phone and just be happy to talk for hours to whoever. And they would just kind of ask you, just some, make a conversation and then sort of just conversate with you and get well, information. Yeah. They would always present it as, oh, well, uh, it would be different people, men or women, 
but they would always uh, say, oh, this is a survey. We're conducting a survey and mm -hmm. then ask me questions about what do you feel about the political situation in East Asia? <laughs> what do you feel about this okay. product? Yeah. It, now, you, so, yeah. so this rundown of, you know, from your childhood of the way that, um, so you've had a, say your family already had a satanic lineage occurring and then you eventually decide to were you groomed to go into the military or did you did you find your way um into it without any did you choose to go into the military yourself explain to um tell me how you got into the military where you and then to where the position that you were in with the department of defense tell me yeah. how um, yes. go ahead so, so then, let's make some disambiguations first for our listeners uh, ultimately, I did join the military. It was the stupidest thing I ever did. It was um, something that yet was almost inevitable, just based on my background. Uh, at the same time, the Department of Defense, which I entered into first, is not the military, it's civilian. So yes, technically, sorry. The, yeah, sorry, yeah. So very important to disambiguate that. Uh, it is involved with the military, but um, the military theoretically is under a civilian chain of command. Uh, but um, just to e e explain to everyone how I got into it, um, the phone calls were important. These surveys uh, display that I was obviously being monitored because nobody is going to take a survey with a young child growing up. It's something I never thought about until, of course, I became more mature. But uh, when um, I did wind up working with the military, uh, there were several confluent events. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, at the time in um, the 80s, in uh, late 70s, early 80s, San Francisco was a cult city. And there was a particular individual named Jim Jones who organized a cult based on the greater Bay Area population, especially attracting many disenfranchised blacks from Oakland. Uh, this individual uh, wound up committing what was called the Jonestown Massacre. And literally with, within a week, literally within uh, a period of maybe about 10 days, uh, you've got the assassination of the mayor of San Francisco. Now, the individual who committed that assassination was a former San Francisco police officer named Dan White. He was supposed to be the stereotypical uh, good Irish Catholic boy, and he felt deeply offended when he lost his job to a gay man who was infamously gay, not simply gay, but out outwardly gay and outspokenly gay, and that was Harvey Milk. Harvey Milk was known as the mayor of Castro Street. This is important. He uh, was one of the men who originated the U.S. Navy SEALs. He was one of the underwater demolition team's experts in the U.S. Navy during the Korean War. And wow. he has a ship named after him. There is a U.S. Navy ship named after Harvey Milk, this infamously uh, gay pedophile, because he would exploit young boys. Uh, that uh, this is a known fact. It's not slander. This is something that um, he needs to be confronted as a part of our history. And we have to ask why this man's face is on stamps, why there's a U.S. Navy ship named after him, that he was one of the founders of the Navy SEALs ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but anyhow, Harvey Milk uh, wound up getting the job of supervisor that used to belong to Dan White. He was in the office with George Moscone, the mayor of San Francisco, and in that same room was a lady named Leanne Prifty, who was Albanian ethnically, an ethnic Albanian, and she worked with the U.S. State Department at night uh, with Radio Free Europe. So she would uh, conduct radio broadcasts behind the Iron Curtain to Albanians uh, who were a very radical extremist communist nation at the time. And uh, she would speak the language of Shkiptieri, the Illyrian language. And uh, so sh this is important, uh, all connected with how I wound up with Michael Aquino. Uh, basically, this woman was considered a lap secretary in her, as her day job for George Moscone. So basically, she wasn't like an official secretary, but she basically gave him blowjobs under the table. And so she happened to be there in the office when uh, Dan White was conferring with George Moscone. 
uh, excuse me, uh, Harvey Milk was conferring with George oh. Moscone. Dan White walked in as a former police officer. He could openly carry a weapon and no one would stop him. He was a former SFPD. So when he walked into City Hall, nobody stopped him. And he went to the mayor's office, pulled his gun out, and Leanne Prifty stood up to stop him. He pushed her to the ground and said, I'm too much of a gentleman to shoot a lady and proceeded to kill the other two men. Now, he never spent a day in jail. He never spent a minute in jail. He went to trial and his lawyer said he was all sugarized, all hyped up on too many Twinkies. It was called the Twinkie defense. And they let him go. And oh, he that's went home. crazy. Yeah, he went home. And then later on, seven years later, like he suddenly had a uh, remote control order, he blew his brains out. Uh, but uh, what happened was that um, Diane Feinstein, she became mayoress of San Francisco, not by election, but by simply being in line of secession. So by line of secession without votes, she became the mayoress of San Francisco and her per political career skyrocketed. Now, this is important. At the same time, shortly after that, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, began uh, shooting and killing people in California. And the uh, police department in Los Angeles was tracking the weapon that was being used. They were able to identify the caliber, the bore, the manufacturer, and they were this close to capturing Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And yeah. they shared their information, of course, with other police departments, including SFPD, a San Francisco Police Department. And then Diane Feinstein got on national television and warned the Night Stalker about this. She said, um, I want people to know that uh, the police are on track. Uh, they've got the weapon that the Night Stalker is using identified. And unless he changes his weapon, he's going to get caught. And That's after that, crazy. he started charging yeah. his weapons. Yeah, changing them. And he was able to escape capture for many more months, if not a few years, thanks to Diane Feinstein. Now, all of this is relevant because... What happened was Leanne Prifty, when Diane Feinstein became mayoress, she said, uh, everyone thinks I'm a dyke. Uh, they think I'm a lesbian and I don't need you in here to reinforce that. That's what she said to Leanne Prifty. She says, I don't need no goddamn lap secretary. You're fired. And so Leanne Prifty was fired. She wound up basically um, working at John O'Connell Vocational Institute of Technology, which it was this nowhere school. It's not a high school, just so people understand that. Mm -hmm. A high school is where a person goes to graduate and then go to a college. You go to a college after a high school. Uh, when you go to a vocational institute, you're supposed to get a job. You're supposed mm -hmm. to get employed. Uh, now, John O'Connell Vocational Institute was infamous that nobody got employed. They call it San Quentin Prep. Uh, basically, it was a gang school. The gangs had taken over the shops and they were using them to tattoo each other. <laughs> all this all this stuff. It was just uh, it was just Latino gangs in the middle of a barrio in San Francisco. What used to be an Irish district at that point uh, between Haight and Bryant and Treat Street. Uh, this was a, a entire city block was John O'Connell because it used to be an auto manufacturing building. And that's why it had all these shops. To yeah. teach kids, uh, you know, how to fix cars and and crap, and uh, but nobody was learning, and everybody was basically uh, gang banging. And um, what happened was that while I was attending there, and she happens to be a secretary in this, this this hellhole, uh, right. she puts the make on me, invites me to her home, and I began sleeping with this lady. And that's when she told me, hey, you know, there's a summer job opening in the Presidio. You know, you go there all the time anyway with your dad shopping at the post exchange and all you got the military dependence ID card. Why don't you get this summer job at the library and you'll really be making bank? And I said, good idea. So I applied for the summer job. I got it. I was a librarian's <laughs> aide, shelving books. Yeah. Thanks to this Albanian spy who was working with the State Department and broadcasting in the Illyrian language behind the Iron Curtain at night, right. I, I get this job. And so when can I um just real quick, do you want to take just a second and then come back where you're taking the job? Because um, you need you to take to a break. 
for like a minute just to just oh sure 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 why, why don't we do right? that because oh, yeah, yeah, i was I'll, messing yeah. with that tech stuff and oh and, uh, honey take your time take but, your time what we could do is i'll just shut up and i'll um uh you know you take uh, a, you yeah, take a we'll minute take a too it's just yeah. a second and yeah. i'm gonna uh, i'm not gonna do anything but just mute and like for a yeah, second yeah. don't worry i'll just sit here and breathe i'll sit here and breathe till you get back don't i'm gonna do the same too and if you want to keep talking or anything like that, but I'll be right back. Or if you want to take the break as well. Oh, I'll, I'll just sit here and and, and, and veg out. <laughs> you just let me know when you're ready to talk again. I'll be yeah. right back. Yeah, take your time. Yeah. So. It was so good, of course, to uh, just uh, get this done tonight. We. Uh, they do everything they can to discourage us and uh, to basically drive us into despair. Uh, and what they did tonight was technically impossible. They knocked off all our um, audio for all three of us. It uh, was definitely a um, uh, a nightmare scenario. Um, uh, this young lady is so resilient and um, you really have to admire her, maintain her in your thoughts and prayers. Um, she seems to be on the side of the good guys. Um, I always have to be suspect, of course. Um, understand that uh, people come up and they're like um, ducks in a shooting gallery, just on an assembly line telling me that they're interested or that they want to interview me. And there's usually an attempt at an ambush and um, that doesn't look like what's going on here. Uh, so I do want everyone to appreciate that fact. And of course, have the deepest respect for what this young lady went through tonight. Uh, and of course, the stress involved with that um, could impact anyone. Uh, and um, I think Aristides was uh, typing something for uh, uh, a minute there. He's welcome to continue. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just telling everybody to uh, okay, maintain you and. I'm a yeah. little. I'm a little chilly as well, so just don't mind me. <laughs> don't worry, honey. Yeah, take your time. Anyways, By the way, okay. um, I was telling everyone to maintain you in their thoughts and prayers and to hold you in the highest respect for everything you went through tonight, uh, that uh, you're uh, very much uh, courageous, uh, that um, this was an example of an extreme attack, and, and you weathered it. You weathered it. Um, and, it was interesting. Uh, I'm just glad we got it figured out. Yeah. Now I'm just going to get a little, because I am just I got a little chilly. Yeah. Okay, so I have to scoot this way. There we go. So about how no. I got the job at the library. Hang on. Yeah. Yep. Take your time. Yeah. Now, okay, so you, this lady, she tells yeah. you maybe you should think about, um, you know, picking up a job there, and your father already goes there, and yeah. so you do go, yeah. and now you're go ahead. Yeah, uh, basically, this chick pillow talks me into uh, <laughs> into the road that leads me straight to hell. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, and uh, uh, so let's put it this way. When um, we are uh, um, uh, dealing with someone like uh, what um, to rephrase what uh, Jennifer Hawkins just said so everyone understands. Because I was a military dependent, I had my own military ID card for a family member, what's called a uh, military dependent ID card for the Presidio, uh, meaning any military base, really, any any open base. It wouldn't be like I couldn't go into Area 51, <laughs> but I could like go into your a normal conventional military base and use their post exchange, as it's called, meaning their shopping center or their hospital. If I needed medical attention, I had access to medical treatment uh, uh, for free at these uh, hospitals because I was a military family member until I turned 18. So I was obviously younger than 18. I was 16 years of age at the mo at, at the most. In fact, I was probably, uh, yeah, I was around 16. So this was after the blood transfusion, which occurred at the age of 14. So I was 16 years of age. There was a, so now a blood transfusion. What was what was that? I mean, I yeah. know what it is, but what in what reference to? Yeah. So just so people understand who are listening to us, what had happened was when I was growing up uh, and we'll get back to the job, we'll get back yeah, to the yeah, job and how I back. wound up working with Michael Aquino. But this is important. This is important because it again showed he was monitoring mm -hmm. me. Uh, just so people know, uh, basically my um, home environment was beyond stressful. Um, my parents 
dearly loved each other, but my father was dealing with complex post-traumatic stress disorder and was an alcoholic. He was not a violent alcoholic, uh, but he was not a pleasant alcoholic. And he ultimately overcame that to his credit, which was why I loved him. I took care of him till the day he died. Yeah. But uh, he was someone who also cooperated with my mother in caring for us. All credit there. Uh, but uh, because of the environment outside the home directly, meaning right outside our door, the moment we left the door, mm -hmm. it was dangerous as hell. We were in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, which got that name because cops were paid hazard duty pay and could afford tenderloin steak every night of the year. So uh, it was, it, it, I can guarantee you this, I've served in war zones all over the world. I've been in combat more than most enlisted servicemen in the military. And I can tell you no place on earth that I've ever seen has been worse than the San Francisco tenderloin. It's the most dangerous area in the world. And uh, so I grew up in there with that level of danger. I was under protection by a Chinese gang. I joined a Chinese gang to survive. And uh, it, basically my mother's training also helped because my mother came from a clan background of yeah. what, yes, of what the Americans would consider to be ninja okay that's a i hate that name now with what hollywood has done to that um and they are not what hollywood has portrayed them as uh historically yes to a degree but many variations let's just say i received martial arts training for now we can go into that again later the depths uh the, or the details thereof and they do matter but what happened was that um at the time that my mother enabled me to survive such a violent environment I had um, some training from my father as well, different little tips here, all the rest of that. I also went to violent schools. The gangs were very active at that time. The Chinatown gangs had conducted massacres in the Golden Dragon restaurant. The watching and the Joy, Joe Boy gangs were recruiting from schoolyards. We literally had shootings, axe fights in schoolyards, axe fights. I mean, axe fights. To give, you an, <laughs> to give you an example, to give you an example of how bad it was, my gang brother, Beaver, he went to Galileo High School, and that's the same high school that produced O.J. Simpson. Oh, and, wow. That's weird. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> O.J. Simpson even visited to give a pep talk when my gang brother Beaver had joined the football team. And yeah, and uh, they used to have signs right outside the high school on various shops and laundromats that yeah. would say, no Galileo High School students beyond this point. That's how violent they were. No one would let wow. them in any business establishment. But anyhow, all that being said, all that stress combined with several other factors led to my suffering a bleeding duodenal ulcer. Now, in those days, oh. they considered that a psychiatric issue. It was a, something that happened to chief executive officers, to military commanders, to uh, presidents. It was considered uh, the stress the result of stress of too much responsibility. And so um, I saw the psychiatrist, several of them, at Letterman Army Medical Center. And this was while I was recovering, recuperating, and understand that my bleeding duodenal ulcer in those days, this was before some crazy Australian doctor, a total charlatan and a fraud, injected himself full of H. pylori virus and triggered his own bleeding duodenal ulcer. And since then they've said that, oh, if you have an ulcer, you're infected with this virus and they give you antibiotics. Now, by the way, that doesn't happen unless you inject yourself full of the H. pylori virus. So it is a stress symptom, and right. but they no longer recognize it as such. In those days they did. So they said, um, well, aside from all the psychiatric issues that they dealt with for a period of time where I was put on Valium and lithium and mm -hmm. under observation, one of the things that happened was they lied to my parents, and uh, I know they lied. Uh, we can go into that later. But what had happened was that my parents were told, your son's bleeding out. Um, the ulcer is so extreme that your son's going to lose all his blood and die. And they said that uh, he needs a full body blood transfusion. And uh, because the blood market has crashed, and this requires some explaining here, just a little bit of a tangent so people understand, 
uh, at that time in those days, they used to pay homeless hobos and alcoholics and prostitutes money to give their blood. And oh. so street people used to donate blood to blood banks. And when enough of them came, became with the advent of AIDS infected, they were already infesting the blood supply with every STD known to man and many other con communicable diseases. But with the advent of AIDS, things reached a crisis point, a critical point that was massive. Just to give you an idea of how massive it was, and this directly impacted myself, uh, you had um, the governor of Arkansas, uh, William Jefferson Clinton, and his wife, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Right. She, had, she had gone to school in England where she had been sorority sisters with two of the most powerful Muslim women in the world. Uh, they were part of a sorority called Hell's Harlots. And while they were there, um, one of them, Tansu Siller, became the prime ministress of Turkey. Turkey. She was so butch, she made her husband take her last name in a Muslim country, no less. Uh, the other became Benazir Bhutto, or was Benazir Bhutto. She was the princess of Pakistan. This is very relevant. Um, when she was in charge of Pakistan, Pakistan had gone through a series of the largest wars since World War II. The most massive tank battles in the world took place in the far desert between India and Pakistan, and they had gone almost nuclear. They both acquired nuclear weapons. So um, at the time that they were heading towards another war, uh, because the blood supply was so bad, and one of the reasons it was getting worse was Governor Clinton in Arkansas, this was a contributing factor among many others, he had um, ordered all the prisoners to donate blood. And he said that way he looked like he was being generous, being charitable. But all these prisoners, of course, were all screwing each other and infecting each other with everything up to and including AIDS. Mm -hmm. So he was further crashing the blood supply. His wife knew this and his wife um, had stock in the blood market and she sold short and she called her sorority sister, Benazir Bhutto, and told her about the situation. Benazir Bhutto took advantage of it. You see, Benazir Bhutto uh, said, hey, we're headed towards another Indo-Pakistani war and we're going to need a lot of blood for injured soldiers. So she told um, uh, the commanding officers, give the soldiers the order to contribute blood, all of them. I want them all to give a pint of blood so we'll have enough of a backup. Mm -hmm. And then she gave separate orders to her medics, the corpsmen, uh, and she told Basically, what happened was the medics following her orders. When all the soldiers came in to contribute blood, they strapped them down and they drained them dry. Oh, they my God. Took all their blood. Are and, you kidding? Like, the, yeah. no, no, of course not. Yeah. And the so, reason they did this was because they all had to take tests when they entered the military. So it was all tested blood. And so it was all pure blood, all clean blood. And when the blood market crashed, Benazir Bhutto approached the blood market and told the world, I've got clean blood, thousands of gallons of it. The blood and, market, I've never even thought of yeah, that yeah. at all. She, That's insane. Yeah. And she said, I but want yes, top dollar. Of course dollar. there would be. Yeah. Of course there would be. Yes. And she said, I want top dollar. And so she made herself a multi millionaire, at least a multi millionaire. She fled to London because she had killed 20,000 mm -hmm. of her own troops. 20,000 of her own troops. Then when years later, she went back to Pakistan, uh, when her sorority sister, Hillary Clinton, was running for president, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton was so confident she was going to win, she called Benazir Bhutto and said, you can go back to Pakistan because when I become presidentress, I'll support you. And Benazir Bhutto went back to Pakistan while Hillary Clinton was running for president. And the moment she stepped off the plane, a suicide bomber whose dad had been killed by her tried to kill her. He blew up, killed 20 people, but missed her. She got into an armored car, was driving, was being driven on the way to her residence. Mm -hmm. And then another suicide bomber threw himself under the armored car and blew himself up. And this killed her. She died the way that soldiers in Afghanistan died, basically by a traumatic brain injury because her the explosion blew her up against the ceiling of the armored car and it smashed her brains out. That was how she died. 
Uh, but um, all of this was inevitable, and it was all part of the story of the crash of the blood market. So it was around this time of the 80s when the blood market had crashed. Uh, my parents were told that um, your son's bleeding out, there's no blood available, and they knew about everything going on in the world, and so they assumed it to be true. And that's when Dr. John Henry Hagman, who every, anybody can look up, his name's John Henry, and then Hagman, like in Hag, and then man with a double N. Hag, man, M-A-N-N. John Henry Hagman is a criminal. He's killed hundreds of people at least, more likely thousands. John Henry Hagman was responsible for grisly medical experiments. He approached my parents and told them, uh, we have nanoplasma, what he called nanoplasma available to put into your son, a synthetic plasma. Everybody we've transferred it into so far has died, but your son's younger, and he'll probably be resilient. We're hoping he can adapt it to his body and that he'll survive. But mm -hmm. other than that, we have no blood to offer. So of course my parents said, use it. And um, that's when John Henry Hagman killed me. I was clinically dead for 24 to 48 hours. How old were you at this point again? 14, I'm sorry. 14, 14. 14. And uh, so I was 14 years old and uh, uh, I died. <laughs> My first death, the first time I was clinically dead, there were plenty of others. And uh, then what happened was that uh, John Henry Hagman, uh, basically, so people understand the context here. Uh, the California economy is enormous. The California economy alone is larger than that of uh, the United Kingdom. It is so large, it is now surpassing that of United Germany. Uh, the only nations on earth that have an economy larger than California's are uh, communist China, the Empire of Japan, and the United States itself, only because California is part of the United States. Right. So when you've got an economy that large and a population this big, uh, we have the highest paid uh, uniformed police service in the world in California. It's the California prison guard system. And their union is so powerful that they made a deal with the United States Army that if California prisoners, of which we have many, volunteered for dangerous experiments, they'd get gubernatorial pardons on death sentences, they'd get uh, shortened life sentences, uh, they'd get uh, prison privileges, depending on the grade of risk with the experiment. So uh, thousands of prisoners were experimented on at Letterman Army Medical Center and thousands of them died. All of it legal because they signed their rights away to be volunteers for military experiments and military doctors do not swear the Hippocratic Oath. So when these prisoners were doing this, I had to provide them as a librarian later in my career reading material for prisoners who were kept for months at Letterman under experimental conditions. Many of them kept till they went insane, fed nothing but salmon for six to nine months, salmon fish till they turned pink, crap like that. Just, That's crazy. Yes, yeah. yeah, silly experiments, some of them, many of them deadly. But when it came to um, myself, uh, this was the background. So they were conducting all these experiments and they had this experimental plasma. When I reanimated, literally reanimated, um, I originally had blood that was my mother's blood, O negative, one of the rarest blood types in the world. When mm -hmm. I reanimated, my blood was O positive, a universal donor almost. I had switch polarities. Oh, it in, that's, in, that's incredible, really. I've never heard of anything like that. It's medically supposed to be impossible, but my bone marrow was able to process this artificial plasma. And obviously, they haven't used it much since. There's right. been a few experiments we suspect with a lot of circumstantial evidence. But in terms of my case... I was bleach white for years uh, it, because it was white blood. It's white blood. It's white synthetic nanoplasma. Mm -hmm. I was like white as a sheet of typing paper for year, you know, months and months, if not years, before I normalized. Uh, and Asians were scared to death of me because white is the color of death in Asia. I was looked upon as truly a ghost in the Asian community. Right. But this was when I was 14. At the same time, they wanted to see if this would pass on that, okay, he survived. Let's see if he can pass on the traits of nanoplasma 
which were enhanced processing capability, um, other improved, um, uh, basically enhanced processed uh, processing ability, uh, improved healing, uh, a number of other uh, uh, phenomenon. They wanted to see if it would pass on. So they sent in a young girl to have sex with me for the two weeks I was there. That was all the psychiatric observation that was going on. Right. So here they were pumping me for Valium and Lithium. I had a whole wing of the hospital to myself and a young lady was coming in to have sex with me three times a day. I had nothing to complain about. <laughs> but right, at right. the same time, uh, I do want people to understand that was a prelude because during that time this young lady was having sex with me, she kept mm -hmm. talking about the old man. The old man sent me here. Uh, I uh, basically uh, had undergone a lot of things for him in the past. He owes me. And uh, she felt that this was a relief from other things she had done. Uh, and uh, this girl did not have a name, just so people understand that. Um, uh, we're going to write more of, of the details about this in the book. I want people to understand this was obviously a, a, a traumatic event in its own obviously i enjoyed the sex but i want people to understand how traumatic this was this woman was essentially a slave right uh, and she was a young lady who was barely 18. She, she, mm -hmm. i i don't even know if she was legal age i do know she was older than me but only by a few years uh but uh this young lady um herself never had a name she had a serial number and that was all she was known by and uh, so I do want people to understand this was where I began to understand the intricacies of the So evil. they were doing this from a clinical perspective to try to see yeah. if they could, um, when she would then, uh, were they taking her embryos or were they going to have like where she would give birth somehow or something? This is an excellent question. This is an excellent question because um, the one thing we do know about John Henry Hagman, if anybody looks up John Henry Hagman, they're going to find out he conducted a lot of sexual experiments. Mm -hmm. He would have his students have sex yeah, with each other. Yeah, that's very common. Yes. People might not realize that, but this is actually very typical yeah. of these, you know, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And he would uh, f um, inject ketamine in people. He would also... Uh, drain their bodies completely of blood and then refill them with blood again to reanimate them. This was something he had done before with with conventional blood. Um, and uh, and many of the people were left his victims uh, because of the ketamine and various other experiments, unable to ever have an erection again. He left them sterile for life, et cetera. So this was par for the course with his kind of experimentation. And what had also happened was with this young lady um, I have no doubt they probably extracted a number of her eggs, but ultimately I was to find out years later uh, she had delivered a child by me. And this was their ultimate intent was to find out if my traits that had been enhanced, the healing and processing abilities by the nanoplasma, if they would be inherited. That was their ultimate objective. When right. I, when my, both my parents died, and we are going to get back to the library job very soon. But when both my parents died, I was almost homeless. And uh, San Francisco, the city and county of San Francisco, San Francisco is one of the few cities that's also a county. Um, they are one of the few places in the world, probably the only place in the world, that has insurance for homeless people. Mm -hmm. So when it, which is why so many homeless people come here. But when I was on the borderline of homelessness, I went in to process for benefits. And when I processed for benefits, uh, I was ushered into this building like a labyrinthine maze of cubicles. I was with a staff worker, a social worker, who had me in a cubicle looking at his computer. And he turned towards me and said, Mr. Dietrich, what about your daughter? I said, daughter? And he said, yes, you gave birth to her, you fathered her when, and he looked at the computer and said, Oh, I'm sorry, you were 14 years old when this when you fathered her. You're not legally responsible. And I said, but please tell me more. I and he said. This is not open for discussion. We right. will say so, no more of this. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And so I, I know for a fact I fathered a daughter with this girl. Mm -hmm. uh, we, by circumstantial evidence, feel we might have found out who it was. Uh, I'll go into that another time. She suffered enough uh, mm -hmm. for for now. I'm I, I'm certainly been public about it before, but you know to continue with our main narrative. So all of this had happened when I was 14. By the time I was 16, when I was with Leanne Prifty and uh, she pillow talked me into this job, and I wound up getting employed. 
it was very quickly that Michael Aquino personally requested me for me to be his liaison, meaning his gopher, kind of like a person who acted as a uh, mobile secretary, if you will. And uh, he was someone who took me in as an intern, basically a sorcerer's apprentice. And uh, during this time, it's important to realize that I had already become a military reference technician. Uh, while I was working these jobs as a librarian's aide, I had graduated early from John O'Connell Vocational Institute, and I also had entered City College. I did not go straight to a job. Of course, nobody who graduated from that school ever got employed. They never got employed at any trade that they were supposed to get employed in because none of them learned anything uh, other than gangbanging. But uh, when I went into um, City there College... Every yes. now and then... It gets a little like the feed does on my end and yours, but it's on my side, but it does oh, pick back up again. So oh, it's it's on both our sides. Yeah, the the Skype will glitch and then it'll it'll normalize. Yeah, but it's fine. Anyway. Yeah. Go ahead and and uh, thank you. And so what had happened was that uh, when I was um, uh, going to City College of San Francisco. I was taking all kinds of credits, far more than the normal student. Literally, at one point, I was taking 25 full credits at once, uh, a full credit load of uh, about a quarter of 100 credits. And I was an honor student on the um, honor roll of uh, City College of San Francisco. Uh, and uh, so what happened was, obviously, I was processing very quickly, handling a lot of academics, uh, physically fit. Um, Michael Aquino, of course, felt yes, that. Yes, one second. So at the transfusions, how did you feel that it affected and changed you? In what way did you feel? How did you feel? You know, I mean, that's a, if you were going, if it's, you know, it would tell me how. I, I felt great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, did, you couldn't probably, you can't tell that your blood's a different blood type now. But I mean, that's interesting on the chemical, you know, the chemical level. But you, yeah, you must have felt, you know, uh, well, it was also or you couldn't or it, or it didn't really affect that way. You well, know, it was just the blood. So it's oh, an amazing process, though, that they were able to do that. Well, let's put it this way. Um, people need to understand that um, uh, in the Soviet Union, when they were doing research on vampires, which just so people know, I wrote a book called Vampirology. It is half the book. We need to get more purchases of it before we can justify the expansion and revision and provide the history behind the physiology that is exposed in that book. The Soviet Union was one of the few states that actually uh, officially went into deep investigation of the phenomenon of vampirism. And um, one of the things that they discovered about or their attitude, their attitude towards blood um, was that it was, quote unquote, a liquid organ. And um, it was during the tuberculosis plague that overtook uh, the Soviet Union in the early days of Stalinism that um, there was one doctor named Bodanov who um, gave his full body blood transfusion of his blood, which he had an immunity to tuberculosis. He volunteered to have all his blood transferred into a tuberculosis patient who was dying and he saved the patient but died himself. Uh, but this is like his way of escape from Stalinism was basically what it was. Uh, but uh, the blood is something obviously mystical, almost on a mystical level of impact. And it is obviously important. People intuitively know this. Uh, but the important thing to understand is that how I felt with this nanoplasma, when I say I felt great, sure. But at the same time, I could easily, and some would claim that this was one of the reasons for all the psychiatric observation, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I was processing so quickly that I almost went insane. It's very difficult to comprehend when you start processing things so quickly that before, whereas I had an artistic skill, I began to illustrate at that point in my life with an almost uh, photographic level of detail. Mm -hmm. uh, this, of course, is still a different type of illustration technique than most people are familiar with and requires explain because a lot of people don't draw anymore. They, they, they work with computers and they do uh, computer illustration. They don't have what we used to have with professional illustration and they don't understand the techniques we used to use for people mm -hmm. who would illustrate for comic books and stuff. It's called storyboarding. But right. um, yeah, but when I um, it's just an example, I, I became I became able to illustrate better 
uh, I became a very talented illustrator. I um, was able to um, memorize things um, uh, in those days, almost photographically. Now understand, in order to maintain my sanity, over the years, I began to uh, abuse a lot of recreational drugs to, to intentionally slow the processing down because the processing is just it 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 otherwise is not healthy. It, it's not healthy, and so uh, I do want people to understand the impact as well was healing. Um, as I've mentioned before, say for instance. Uh, uh, he, so people understand this, and then we'll get back to working with Aquino and what he said about uh, how I got hired. Um, uh, I do want people to understand that um, when it comes to, say, for instance, how this blood impacted me, uh, I was in the Gulf War, and this was what Americans call the first Gulf War. It really, they should call it Bush War One, Bush War Two, because the first Gulf War was really between Iran and Iraq and lasted almost 10 years and uh, a million people died at least. Um, so the American Gulf War was Gulf War Two, and uh, the invasion of Iraq was really Gulf War Three. Um, so uh, just so people understand that historically. Mm -hmm. But when it came to Operation Desert Storm, I was exposed to cyclosaurine nerve gas. And everybody needs to understand this is on my medical records. This is incontestable. So right. I was exposed to cyclosaurine nerve gas to the point where uh, basically what had happened was the um, my lungs began to collapse. It happened like uh, they it, at some point they were so scarred by the um, nerve gas that they developed blisters very large blisters in my lungs. And then eventually what happened was uh, they scrolled down and collapsed one time. And then what happened was that when that when that took place, just so people understand the gravity of the situation, uh, most stab wounds or uh, bullet wounds in the torso, unless they penetrate the heart directly and kill you, mm -hmm. uh, obviously you're not gonna die immediately. But what happens is your lung will more than likely collapse right. because it'll be penetrated by a bullet or a knife. Then what kills you is that that vacuum becomes filled with blood and mucus and pus and begins to pressure against the heart until you do die. So mm -hmm. most people who die of knife or gun, you know, bullet or, or blade injuries, they die of a collapsed lung. So this is serious business. And mm -hmm. what had happened was that in my case, I called the San Francisco paramedics who, there's some good ones out there, but I have not had good experiences in general. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah. so they showed up, mm -hmm. two, yeah. two idiots showed up at my home and they, you know, the little oxygen clip, they put the little oxygen clip on my finger mm -hmm. and they said, you're breathing fine. <laughs> what you're having is a panic attack. And they said, why don't you just relax and, you know, uh, leave us alone. And <laughs> they went away. By the way, what they did was completely illegal. When you call an ambulance, they are required by law to take you. It's, they right. don't have a choice. Right. So, so these were criminals. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. but but all that being articulated. Uh, so then I my gang brother took me to a meal. And um, all the while I'm sitting there like, and then I start turning blue, like my shirt. And while I'm turning blue, he says, man, you don't look so good. Uh, I said, oh, oh uh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, and I said, take me to the hospital, Daniel. And, <laughs> and he said, okay. So he drove me to the emergency room. But this is where <laughs> oh, no. we get into the Not phenomenon. Funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm <laughs> no, so it's funny sorry. as hell. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's funny as hell. <laughs> I ought to tell you the story about Brendan it's Zogut sometime. It's the way you're telling it. The way but, that you're telling yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. I ought to tell you the story about Brendan Zogut sometime, and you'll die laughing with the shit Ew, that happened really? to him. But anyhow, okay. in my case, so uh, <laughs> this, this, this is where we get to the case of Chinese doctors. Now, I do want people to understand this. Obviously, I'm... I'm half Asian, I can say this. I do want people to understand that the Asian community has cultural uh, tendencies that can be positive and po or negative. And um, being uh, gung-ho Confucianist about studying is both a positive and a negative. It's not always a good thing. And what happens in a lot of Chinese families in particular is the poor kid's born and the parents say, 
you're going to be a doctor. There's right. no choice. It's not what you want to grow up to be or what do you want. It's you're going to be a doctor. And there's <laughs> right. a lot of Chinese kids that just grow up hating what they're doing. They're completely resentful. And for Americans who don't comprehend this, becoming a doctor, by the time you get your medical degree, you're 40. You're 40 years old. You spend like 10 years minimum uh, right. after graduating with a master's degree, getting that medical degree in what's essentially a student phase of 10 years. And uh, so you, you've blown your life. If you're going to be a doctor, there's nothing else you're ever going to be in any normal right. situation. So a lot of these Chinese kids are miserable. Now, Chinese doctors could be the best in the world. I have a Chinese doctor now. I think he's fine uh, as my general practitioner. But a lot of them, they're psychotic. They don't want to be there and they'll kill you. <laughs> and so I ran into one of those. So basically, I put into the emergency room. At this point, I'm blue, literally blue. I'm brought in. And then the Chinese doctor gets a chest tube out. He says into my ear. I'm going to fucking kill you. And then he rammed the chest tube through like he was harpooning a whale. Are you? That's <laughs> he jammed it to me like he was staking a vampire in a movie. And by some miracle, he missed my heart. But he collapsed the other lung. And I you. died again. I clinically died. That's <laughs> I was clinically dead. Yeah. And then by the time I reanimated it, some 24 hours later, I had two chest tubes in me holding my lungs up. If you can imagine the pain of plastic, serrated plastic against your ribs, uh, holding my lungs up that were reinflated. And I'm breathing, just, you know, gasping, gasping for air. And while I come to, there's this female medical student, for lack of a better word, they hate that term, uh, the um, teachers are called attending, I think. I forget what the doctors on the floor, basically the students are called. But in those days, they used to put them through this crush where they were like testing this macho, toxic um, endurance. We got to, you want to, yeah. let's check the, I haven't been looking at the chat at all for YouTube. But 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 <laughs> when it, when it came to, when, when I came to, this yeah. doctor who was like the medical student looking at me, uh, her name was Dr. Doof something. I only remember the first name. It was a hyphenated name because I thought of her as a doofus, D-U-F-F. -F. And I kept wondering, why am I so scared of this woman? Why am I so scared of this? Why does she frighten me so much? I realized what it was. She had a thousand yard stare because she had been awake for three days. She'd been awake for three days. She sent me home, by the way, without stitching up my chest tube sites. She yeah. put band-aids on them. Oh, goodness, Ian. I can't do it did. that way. Yeah. She, Just one she, second. I have to to look at the, it's going to pull the actual thing up. It doesn't matter right now. Um, I just want to, let's say hello to, um, even though it's going to pull everything aside, but I wanted to look at the chat. I can't, I'm, this is completely new to me, everyone. So um, I know it's pulling up. What you're seeing right now is just this, but um and there might be a delay, but I want to say hello to, let's look at everybody in the chat for just a minute, Mr. Dietrich. I'm sorry to interrupt. And then, but only for a few minutes, because we're in the middle of um, an interview, but uh, I hope you guys are doing good. It looks like um, Algorithm is here. Um, Jay, Mike, um, Smurf, um, Liam, a lot of people in here tonight. So, and all very interested in listening. So this is fantastic. Um, anyway, we're going to get back to, I'm just kind of focusing on, I hope you guys are, yeah, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, it's just mostly about. Um, yeah, pain and suffering. It's, to us, we're kind of just <laughs> visiting and then, um, and I'm doing this interview with him and letting him speak. And then, um, but thank you for coming and visiting with us. And uh, anyway, now back to now. So. So, so, so uh, this is where the nanoplasma comes in. This is where it's relevant. So you got this Dr. Doofus, as I call her, Dr. Doof something, the hyphenated name. When she sent me home, she had bandaged, and I, I had assumed she had stitched my chest tube sites, but she hadn't. And she sent me home with them covered only in Band-Aids because she had been awake for three days. 
And uh, when I went home, basically what I had was two sucking chest wounds. <laughs> two sucking chest wounds. That's crazy. And uh, if you've ever seen a, a floater, they call them floaters. This is when bodies wash up on the beach and they're all bloated. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's what happened to me. I looked like the Michelin mummy. And my um, neck swelled up so much with all this sepsis. This is systemic infection. My neck yeah. swelled up with all the sepsis that when I called the 911, I sounded like a Muppet and they thought it was a practical joke. They, I'm, I'm like saying, help, I can't breathe. And, and you know, help, I can't breathe or something like that. And then the guy said, yeah, man, maybe you should, you know, take a, you know, let go of your nose and stupid shit like this. And okay. I said, no. And then he says, look, we don't have time for these practical jokes. And he hung up. He hung up, which, by the way, is also illegal. Right. right. <laughs> and so, so, but luckily, I'm sorry, honey. Please. Oh, no. Um, yeah. Let's tell them about um, the Presidio and Michael Aquino. Sure. Let's sure. tell okay. them about that. So, so just to put all that aside for now, uh, just understand that without the nanoplasma, I would not have survived all of this, obviously. Uh, right. my genetics and the nanoplasma. Obviously, I can suffer grievous injuries and survive. Mm -hmm. So I do want people to understand this. Uh, that that should be obvious at this point. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, what I'm describing. It's a horror story that obviously I could render into a mini series. <laughs> so uh, just understand without the nanoplasma, I wouldn't be here um, among uh, also the genetics that enabled me to survive the nanoplasma, which we'll go into some other time. So when I was liaising with Michael Aquino, Michael Aquino brought up um, Diane Feinstein, who our dear friend Aristides brought up is dead, you know, died uh, uh, on the 29th of September this year. And yeah. I do want people to understand that there was another death that we should get to tonight because it is quite relevant. And that is Frank Borman died yesterday by now, today, essentially yesterday by now. And he was the NASA astronaut, the oldest one alive. Oh, yeah, you sent that to me. I saw that. Yes, and it's very relevant. We'll get to that later. Uh, but um, what happened was that when it came to um, the um, Michael Aquino, he had pointed out to me, uh, Douglas, you know, uh, uh, you remember Diane Feinstein and the Night Stalker. And of course, I was familiar with the Night Stalker. And the reason I was so painfully familiar with the Night Stalker, understand Michael Aquino was um, U.S. Army Green Berets. I mean, forget everything about John Wayne. That's all Hollywood uh, nonsense. Understand that when you think of U.S. Army Green Berets, think of Michael Aquino and think of Master Sergeant uh michael ramirez uh not richard ramirez but michael ramirez his father his, his uncle his, his uncle. uncle and so master sergeant michael ramirez had been sentenced to um methadone treatments at letterman army medical center and i had to keep him at bay in the library from going into the children's room uh, he was constantly trying to go into the children's room and molest the children. He had a shoebox full of memories that he would share with the adults. He would have shared them with the children had I not prevented him. I'm certain that when other people were on duty, he probably got away with everything he wanted. But when I was on duty, I wasn't going to tolerate that. And so I would draw him aside and distract him by holding conversations with him while I was doing my work. And um, one time I asked him about the shoebox. He showed it to me. I looked through all the photographs and these were pictures he had taken of young woman he had raped and tortured to death in Vietnam. He would basically cut their breasts off with his bayonet. Uh, he would uh, rape them orally. Uh, he called it skull fucking while he had a gun to their head and then blow their brains out at the moment that he ejaculated. This was right. the kind of monster this individual was. When I asked him, look, you've gotten away with so much. Uh, how did you get away with, you know, uh, whatever it was you did? What did you do? I asked him to to get sentenced to the methadone treatment. And that's when he said, I blew my wife's brains out. And uh, that's when I said, you Apparently know, most... who this was again. I'm sorry, honey. What? What's that? Uh, the person who was doing this, who you were talking, who you're talking to. Oh, Claire? Michael Ramirez, the master sergeant, Michael the... Ramirez of yes. the U U.S. Army Green Berets, the uncle of Richard Ramirez. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, important. Yeah. yeah. And um, so he um, basically had uh, 
what I was wondering was how he got sentenced at all, because I said most of the time Green Berets, these special forces troops will murder their entire family and they'll just say it's post-traumatic stress disorder and let them go. They'll, they'll get off on some psychiatric excuse. Uh, but in um, his case, and, and by the way, just for people who are doubt of that, we could go into that later. Uh, there's di different cases where this has happened and soldiers have gotten away with literally murder. Um, but when it came to Michael Ramirez, he was sentenced because there was a witness. And I said, uh, who was the witness to you killing your wife? And he said, oh, it was my nephew, Richard Ramirez. Oh, wow. and, and I said, did this bother him? He said, no, he got off on it. He used to take my shoebox full of these pictures, go to the graveyard every night and jack off to them under the moonlight. Right. And so, so what you're looking at here is that, again, the emphasis that inside of um, the environment you were working in, you were coming into contact with these people who were just very extreme, really, you know, to, to not and most people would not even fathom this do you see what i'm saying so they might find it shocking but in this environment this is there was a concentration of this type of and what year about about what time um the time what, do you remember i mean Jeez, yeah, this, this had to be this had to but, be around uh 84 80 uh 88 maybe about between 84 and 86 mm -hmm. this when so much of this went down okay and uh, then Go yeah, on. and that's interesting. It was during the time of the, you know, okay, and then the Presidio yeah. Daycare Center. A lot of people are no longer even familiar with what the story is and about how it was burned down and about. Yes. Um, so, so let's get into that. And I do want people to understand some of the connectivity here, though. Um, when it came to. It seems um, well connected, isn't it? I mean, it, it yes. seems. Yeah, go ahead. It is. Yeah, understand that um, Michael Ramirez. Uh, is uh, part of what Michael Aquino uh, called his California Little League. And ultimately, Richard Ramirez was part of that California Little League. And by that, what Michael Aquino was referring to was a little league of serial killers. The serial killers all over the United States, mm -hmm. but California had its own special Little League. And it was uh, basically, we also had the Golden State Killer. And just so people understand, uh, they can look up the Golden State Killer history and he was also a military uh, officer who had served as a police officer and basically got away with murder uh, in what ultimately amounted to very likely hundreds of murders. Though we know scores can be proven, we know that there were many more that have never been traced. Uh, all of this is a product of this military environment. These were the people I worked with every day. Yeah, I and I, yeah. I, it, it, yes. And then um, we'll we'll have to try to get into you know, if possible, if you have the time and everything, and if it works out that way, you know, about how, who Michael Aquino is, and um, to tell them about that more, because a lot of people may not know who this is. And then too, the effect, the temple of set that he was involved with. Now I have to go into a great deal of detail, but yeah. just explaining, and then how, why he was, he was a general, wasn't he? A colonel, yeah. wasn't he a colonel? Yes. Yes. So let me explain that and also explain to people that when he told me how I got the job when he was and we'll get to his history, we'll get to his history uh, when, uh, by the way, Michael Ramirez ultimately died of a heroin overdose, just so people know that uh, when it came to uh, Michael Aquino sharing history with me and the like. One of the things he brought to my attention was Diane Feinstein. Uh, and he said, uh, remember how she was helping Richard Ramirez? And then he pointed out Richard Ramirez worked for me just like his uncle did. And one of the things he was pointing out was that you remember Dan White? And I said, of course. And how he killed the mayor? I said, yeah, of course. And uh, well, that's how Leanne Prifty got fired by Diane Feinstein. And that's how you got this job. Remember, I had the mayor of San Francisco and the mayor of Castro Street killed so you could work for me. That's crazy, too. That he, yeah. Michael Aquino said that to you. Is that what Yes. You yes. How and, did you, when did you first meet him? You know, you know, I first I became uh, aware of him when I was 14 with a blood transfusion. As I mentioned, uh, the old man, the girl kept referring to. I realized by her description of him that I had seen him in the Presidio a lot. He stood out like a sore thumb because he wore full pancake makeup. He had the horned brow that was clipped 
so that he would look like the devil himself. And he had the widow's peak and he had a 666 tattooed on his scalp. So in the cloverleaf formation, like he, um, which is what they do in prisons, but uh, altogether he stood out well enough where you could recognize him. Uh, bear in mind, right outside the Presidio military base, which was 1,400 acres, took up a good part of San Francisco. Yes, uh, huge. Yes, yes. Just so people understand it, if if you were to hold up your hand where you had like um, uh, your thumb, your San Francisco would be the fingernail. And uh, the rest of your thumb would be the peninsula on which San Francisco is. Yeah, mm -hmm. That would be South San Francisco and the like. And uh, a quarter of that thumbnail would be the Presidio. And uh, this is the most valuable land in the world. And uh, this is like, uh, if, here we have so much of it going to that military base. And it was uh, there forever. And outside of the Arguello Gate was the... Uh, Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, the founder of the First Church of Satan. Yeah. Uh, and so his cousin was mm. in the Army Reserves and mm. was also in the Presidio. So you have this military connection with the Church of Satan right outside the, the door, so to speak, which Michael Aquino had originally joined. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1968, just when he was shipping out to Vietnam. He joined the First Church of Satan of Anton Zandor LaVey who kept a living lion in his own home. Right. And, and um, so we're talking about extremely unusual people, all the extreme, just to give people an idea of how extreme before I go back need, to the history. Yeah, they'll need the references. Yeah. Are, so go yeah. ahead, though. Yeah, so people have an idea of how extreme my environment was. Um, we had, of course, for adult soldiers, Playboy magazine, Penthouse magazine coming in every month. Mm -hmm. Nobody looked at that. Nobody looked at that. I would look at them because I enjoyed full-bodied woman, mature woman. All guys would laugh at me and say, you like those bleeders, they called them. Bleeders. They say, you like those bleeders? And all of them say, we can't stand any girl that's over nine years old. Yeah. This is like the norm. This is like the norm in terms of the soldier that I would be talking to on a daily basis. They're so, at the Presidio base, you say? They're at the Presidio military base, but these, these were guys who transferred from all over. And of course, the Presidio military base had transfers on a daily level. So you had guys coming in and out. This was the norm in the U.S. military. Uh, they go all over the world so they can have sex with children and not be arrested for it. This is why so many men join the military. It's a, one of the primary reasons. And just so people understand, this was why all the human child trafficking was rife in the U.S. military. And I'll get to the child daycare center because of that. And understand that all of this Aquino played a great role in. So understand that when it comes to uh, the attitude, military attitude toward children, here's a good example. I knew this one son of a bitch named Keith Johansson. And uh, Keith Johansson was in the U.S. Army. And he relayed to me a crime. And uh, when he relayed to me the crime, he says, yeah, I was in Panama when I was stationed in Panama. You know, there was a bunch of these board guys and we were doing combat practice and they had a mortar and a bunch of these kids were playing soccer in the field uh, across the way, you know, because we're holding war games and we're just setting off mortars because Panama's a small country. Nobody gives a shit. And, uh, you know, we're 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 doing this in what's practice for urban combat. And so they were bored. So they turned the mortar around. They mortared all the kids and killed them all. And I said, why didn't you report this? He said, why? They're just niggers. And I said, well, technically, they're Latin American. Uh, were they black? Uh, well, no, but they're not white. And I said, well, would you think of reporting it now? You know, there's no time limit or statute on murder. He said, are you kidding? I wouldn't risk my retirement. So this is the attitude. You've got all these military men with a code of silence, not reporting each other because they're all on retirement and they're not going to risk that to report each other. But they all do shit like this in general. We can. And, are they, and a lot of these, where are they? OK. And then the Satanism in the military itself. Yes. yes. And this started uh, with the fact that it's not your father's military. It started with the end of the draft. Uh, basically, when you had a draft, then you had all kinds of men going into the military uh at the same time during vietnam you had an incredible frag rate for officers meaning men were killing their own officers 
men were attacking their own officers. And I had to deal with the records of this. And just so people understand the enormity of what I'm talking about, uh, the amount of records that were tabulated concerning officers attacked by their own men, fragged, was 20,000. The Vietnam War was the most dangerous war in human history to be an officer. Uh, soldiers did not want to obey their officers. They were so killing they like their a officers. Thing. They would kill them. Yeah. I yes. See. Yes. This was quite regular. And ultimately, it was one of the factors in the war ending when uh, Vietnam was, well, when Nixon, when Nixon Vietnamized Vietnam in 1973, which was two years before the fall of Saigon. When he Vietnamized it, he was basically making a virtue of necessity because commanders were given the orders for advance and entire battalions simply were not advancing. <laughs> so at that point, Nixon said, we're just going to Vietnamize the war. <laughs> you can't fight a war if the troops aren't going to fight. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so I could go in this to this for hours, but the point is with Aquino, Michael Aquino entered at a time Amidst all this fragging and the way he would keep the troops at bay would be one of the ways was through fear. Understand that when you're in military environments, you're essentially in a prison environment. And when you're in prison, how do prisons environments, what happens in them? You get ethnic gangs, you get ethnic enclaving. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Vietnam, everybody should be aware by now Vietnam was an ethnic gang military where blacks were with bloods and whites were flying the Confederate flag. This right. is all true. Yeah. So, yeah, the just so people understand, the largest prison race riots in American history took place in Vietnam at mm -hmm. Long Bin Jail, LBJ. So this is how serious the situation was. One of the big race riots took place on a, an American aircraft carrier. Uh, so uh, just so people oh, that's understand, pretty amazing, really. It is. It is. Yeah. It, this, it, these were blacks and whites killing each other with knives and forks. So you, you've got a prison environment, and so Michael Aquino was like a prisoner. He had the six 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 cloverleaf tattooed on his scalp, and he already had that fear impression. You see, in prison, they intimidate each other through the occult. They get the 666 cloverleaf tattoo, they get occult symbols, and they basically threaten each other with as much the mojo as they do with violence. Like, I'll put the curse on you. I mean, these guys got nothing to do, so they spend all day killing each other, fucking each other, cursing each other. And uh, believe me, sometimes those spells work. I mean... Oh, you know what? We should, um, we will get to, if anybody ever ha has any would would you answer some questions later off of the chat? Sure, sure, I'd be willing to. But not right now. Yeah. But um, this, after a while. So, so when it comes to Michael Aquino, understand that here was a guy who was a lieutenant colonel at the time that I was working with him. He retired as what we call a full bird colonel, but he was not a general in the U.S. military. He laterally transferred to intelligence because he could no longer advance in the military because I had effectively ruined his career, he ultimately joined the National Security Agency and became a deputy director, what is called in the bureaucracy a super grade, which means he was the civilian equivalent of a general. So he ultimately right. retired with the civilian equivalent status of a general, but it was in, in NSA intelligence, which of course controls communications in our country, which is how they attacked our dear Jennifer Hawkins tonight. It's that's NSA. They control our communications. That's what they're responsible for. So when it comes to when we're attacked by NSA, these are cultists of Aquino still in embedded in the NSA. So when it comes to Michael Aquino and his background, understand that you had a man who during the time of all this enormous fragging was then uh, taking advantage of it by basically replacing all of these slaughtered officers with satanists members of his cabal so yeah, that's, that's, this is this is this is for me like so i really want to to hear this please i'm sorry i interrupted you but yeah. to tell you that just so you would go in as much detail as possible yes, yes. <laughs> just so people understand michael aquino uh was someone who this is the legend this is the legend and i'll tell you the truth the legend is michael aquino was like traipsing around <laughs> and saw the theater with 
Rosemary's Baby. And mm -hmm. then he went to see it and it was the opening. And the man who had acted as the occult advisor consultant for the movie was Anton Zandor LaVey. And right. he encountered him there and then joined the First Church of Satan. And that was supposed to be his introduction to Satanism. Now, it's, people may not know that. Repeat that again. So, uh, uh, Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, the founder of the First Church of Satan, was the occult consultant for Rosemary's Baby, the movie. And what happened was that he was at the opening night in San Francisco, and the Maquis Theater uh, basically was advertising that fact. And Aquino, supposedly, according to urban legend, uh, was traipsing around innocently, then winds up saying, oh, I think I'll see a movie, winds up meeting Anton Zandor LaVey and converting to the First Church of Satan. None of this is exactly as it seems. Basically, what happened was that Michael Aquino was ordered to infiltrate the church, and he was ordered by the U.S. Army because he was a member of the John F. Kennedy Special Forces Psychological Warfare Operations right. School, a graduate yeah. thereof. And they said that, hey, Anton Zandor LaVey has got all kinds of occult secrets that could help us. So we want you to infiltrate his church. Now, he was already a member of a different cult, Aquino, before he joined the Church of Satan. He was a member of this military cult known as the Kings of Edom, and they also called themselves the Tribe. You can look that up and you'll find some references to it. You'll probably hear it mentioned in The Men Who Stare at Goats, that movie starring George Clooney. Uh, now, all of this is important. I'll get to that. When it comes to Michael Aquino, he was assigned by the U.S. military to infiltrate the Church of Satan and ultimately jack it, take it over. Uh, instead, what happened was he wound up over the years uh, in a magical battle and a battle of wits and wills, willpower, uh, ego with uh, Zandor LaVey, who ultimately kicked him out. And he formed his own church, the Temple of Set, mm -hmm. schismatic. Now, there's a practical reason for this. Anton Zandor LaVey was preaching a uh, atheistic Satanism. As he himself said, it was Ayn Rand with magical ritual attached. So uh, when it came to uh, what needs to be understood here was that uh, when it came to uh, Mr. Karl Marx, his real birth name was rabbi. And by the way, that's also a name. It's not just a religious position or uh, a clerical um, uh, profession. Yeah, it's like also, rabbi, uh, yeah. rabbi. Yeah. Yeah. So his name was Rabbi Mordecai Levy. Uh, that was mm -hmm. the real name of Karl Marx. Karl Marx developed godless communism. And uh, this had an enormous murderous impact on the world. Now, one of the refugees from communism was Ayn Rand. She was a Russian Jewess. And she developed a godless capitalism called her objectivism. And Ayn Rand's philosophy was then taken by, and by, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know what Ayn Rand is all about, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand uh, wrote in her private journals about how much she admired a particular serial killer who had taken a young girl out and spent weeks torturing her to death. And she said, this man should be president. That's, that's Ayn Rand. And mm -hmm. so Ayn Rand's philosophy of, of objectivism was taken by uh, Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, who was also ethnically Jewish, and he took it straight to godless atheism. In other words, there is no Satan, but we have magical ritual and a belief in your ego. You are Satan. And this was his claim was that you could empower yourself to be Satan on earth, that you uh, Satan is within you because you are Satan. And uh, this is the philosophy of Anton Zandor LaVey. But Anton Zandor LaVey was also, uh, he hated That's churches. That's interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that how do you think that tie? Well, we don't have to go into it, but do you think that I think that could tie into you know yes. how Charles Manson and the Process Church they talked about that they are Lucifer, Jesus, you know, yes, all of it together. Absolutely, <clears throat> it, it's all the same. It it's yeah. all part of this network. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. For those of you who don't know, Maori Terry wrote the book The Ultimate Evil. That's the title of his book, and Maori Terry uh, felt so uh, devastated by his conclusion that this was one giant satanic cult 
running America, enabled by the police, that he ultimately drank himself to death. And he's right. And I'll tell you how right now is is basically this is how it works when um, uh, when when I started hemorrhaging the facts about human child trafficking at the Presidio and understand that the U.S. Army alone at that time in history with military bases in East Germany, excuse me, West Germany, in West Germany, in Panama, in Okinawa, all over the world, uh, they had daycare centers all over the world for the military families. And um, at that time, the U.S. Army alone was uh, taking care on a daily basis of 100,000 children a day on a daily basis. And uh, so then what happened was when I was exposing all this information, uh, the FBI became involved. The ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, became involved investigating the fires, which we'll get into when people were burning down the uh, daycare center of children. And later the military responded by burning down the record center so that the parents would have no evidence that their children had been trafficked. Uh, All of this was one building after another burning down. They brought the ATF in to investigate it. And the ATF said, it's definitely arson. And uh, What's interesting is people can actually look this. It's in the news. I mean, it's in the old papers. It's it did happen. It's not. (laughs) <laughs> all of this actually is verifiable and can yeah. be sourced through the the not well, not the uh, finer details Mr. Dietrich's revealing, but the events themselves. You can find they are sourced. Um, you can Presidio did burn down. Yes. Um, the records department was burnt down. Um, these children did. You know there was trafficking going on. Um, what we're saying like what's what he's saying about with um all of this about the stories with um michael aquino himself the position he held that he created the temple of set that he was you know and that there there was a slow switch over of satanism in the military as many of these other officers would go missing or would leave be forced out in a way um, cause it seems like there was some of that too, also that there was a, yeah, absolutely. Here's a good uh, example, old guard, so to speak, yeah. and bringing in a new guard. So, you know, absolutely. And here's a great example of it. When I was working at the Presidio military base, uh, and what I was exposing, I also was exposing what was going on at other military bases. Now, one of the things that I was doing as a liaison for Michael Aquino was covering for him. I was also exposing him. But in a sense, I covered for him in such a way he didn't expect I was exposing him. So I had to, like a spy, this is what an espionage agent does or an undercover cop does. If you're an undercover cop or a spy, there's certain things you're going to be doing that are criminal uh, in order to expedite your ultimate objective for your side. In order to help the public, the only thing I could do was cooperate in a number of criminal areas, such as covering up for Aquino whenever he was on base when he wasn't supposed to be. Uh, there were times when he would enter the base through the tunnel system. For those of you who don't know, uh, there were ancient tunnels dug by the slaves. These were uh, the Indians uh, that were um, enslaved by the conquistadors who had built the Presidio. Its original name was El Presidio Real de San Francisco. And it was uh, built during the days of the conquistadors. Uh, The officers club building is established in 1776. It's as old as any building on the East Coast. I would assume that even the location itself has significance for them for some reason. And not just that they, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And those tunnels were expanded during the Cold War where they added underground bunkers uh, the controls for the Nike Zeus anti-ballistic missile system. If someone were to launch an intercontinental ballistic missile at San Francisco, theoretically, they could have launched missiles that would have emerged from across the bay, controlled through Presidio, that would have taken out that missile incoming, uh, an anti-missile system. So mm-hmm. this was called Nike Zeus Hercules, the entire system of missiles. So these Fantastic, were... really. Yeah. You know, le- yeah. Name- lead line. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Yeah, these were all lead line bunkers. And so many of these, along with the old cannon bunkers for firing at ships that might come into port, all of these bunkers became interconnected with tunnels. And this is where they kept hundreds of children. Michael Aquino used to enter the base secretly through those tunnels. At times, he was supposed to be in West Virginia or at other parts of the country. At times like that, I never exposed him. I simply said Michael Aquino was not present on base during that time, according to our papers. According to, uh, he did not enter through the gate. Therefore, technically, he never entered the base. But he was on base in the tunnels. So this is all true. And uh, when it came to the other factor here, uh, he was in West Virginia, and of course, that's also where many times, and that's also West Point. And so people need to understand that the child daycare center in West Point at that time was building number 666. And uh, so um, I'll keep talking while, <laughs> while Jay, so in building number Yeah, six, I just have to um, check on my, I have. Yeah. My do you want me to up. take a break or do you want me to keep talking? Do you want to take a break for a minute? Sure, I'll take a break. I'll just take a breather. I'll just breathe. Let's take a break for a minute, if you like, and I'll be back in just a little bit. Take your time, darling. I'll I'll keep bandwidth burning. I'll keep bandwidth. I'll just talk casually. So, yeah, I want everyone to understand uh, what a wonderful young lady Jennifer is. She uh, uh, works hard, you know. um, She's working tomorrow, so uh, God knows. I hate to keep her, um, uh, you know, up so late into the night. I mean, it's 11 uh, p.m. here, but it's like uh, three hours ahead where she's at. No, two hours ahead. Uh, 11 to 12, 12 one. It's 1 a.m. where she's at. And uh, then again, she's on our show uh, at times uh, fairly late and uh, seems to be able to handle it. So uh, not feeling, you know, too guilty about it, but guilty enough. And um, yeah, all that being said, uh, we are... Um, you know, keeping this going and uh, I could check into the chat, but, you know, that would require my looking at uh, what's on her channel. Let me take a look. Uh, you know, I would. Uh, I'm more used to doing this than she is. Yeah. And uh, so. Of course, you wouldn't think it to look at what I'm doing now. What am I doing? <laughs> First thing I'm going to do is close. My own OBS. And then we're going to take a look at. Um, her channel. Let's go to her channel. And uh, there's a question for you in the YouTube chat. Thank you, Nemo. Uh, let's take a look at live, make certain the voice is off. And I can see my own uh, head moving around. And uh, let's take a look here. Uh, Troubled Minds is with us. Those are the radio people, or that might be her. Uh, and uh, Thomas Payne says, is this the Douglas Dietrich on the YouTube? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me yeah. okay, Mr. Dietrich? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I do want to say, um, you you know, uh, okay. I want to say that I am so appreciative of everyone's comments and ideas in the chat. And I will also say um, that Mr. Dietrich is my guest. And so I'm so grateful for this interview. So should any of you not like this information? or in a closed-minded way, not take it seriously in the realm of respect of the search for truth, you know where the door is. And I'll remind you that only in searching will you find the truth. So remember that um, Mr. Dietrich is my guest and this is my my house here in the situation and no one needs um, keyboard warriors who can't be respectful to information, even if it doesn't jive with a, you know, the wishes of every everyone's ideas of truth. Uh, be a truth seeker. Um, so go to those places, hear those stories, or don't bother. And um, that said, thank all of you. I, I thank all of you for being here. And um, let's get back to actually interviewing Mr. Dietrich and hearing what he has to say, because that's the that's the you know that's the reason we're here. Thank and um, and take the information in. Go cross check this information if you like. And um, I just wanted to say that because I know that this can some of this stuff may um, some people may have an opinion. And it's like, well, we're not. It's right now. It's about hearing Mr. Dietrich's account and the information that he has to say. And um, if you don't want to sit and um, hear it, then just go. And um, 
or if you can handle it to sit and listen to it, then do that. But this is uh, Mr. Dietrich, Mr. Douglas Dietrich, the former um, research librarian for the Department of Defense and author, a public informant, um, and, so, and so very knowledgeable. And there at the time, while the Satanism was coming into the military, and when it was really having an impact on the policies that were coming about. And this is not, uh, there's no bias here. It's just information Thank that's it. And that's important. Yes, bless you. Very well said, very well said. And, uh, and important to remember that if it sounds like I'm going off on a tangent at times, ultimately, as uh, Jennifer observes, it really is all connected. Uh, so understand we were talking about West Point and the importance there was uh, at the time Michael Aquino was in West Virginia and uh, the sheriffs were investigating him there in West Virginia as well, where they found out uh, in investigating the local satanic coven that uh, all the members were U.S. Army officers who were members of the Temple of Set. Uh, so he, um, he was so powerful, so influential that he ultimately was asked to write the chaplain's handbook. So understand that the U.S. military, all branches of service, this means Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, as well as Army, uh, all their chaplains are, uh, were handling a, a, a chaplain's handbook that was written by Michael Aquino. And he was put in charge of writing the chaplain's handbook because he in, integrated into that handbook yeah, I mean, he uh, wrote the chaplain's handbook. That's and this is, yeah. this is huge. Yeah. The kind of impact that he. Yeah. Sorry about that. I had to go. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. And by the way, if you want to come back on camera, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> yes. had to. I had to go check on this and that, and then, and then. But you know, I understand people may be like, "Well, I don't agree with." It doesn't matter if you agree with it. Right now, yeah. it's important to just. Yeah. Listen, and, again, and I, but I do appreciate um, the ideas and that you people are you know, enjoying this as much as I am. And I hope that you will um, have the patience <clears throat> to hear perspectives, firsthand account perspectives and the way, and please um, continue Mr. Dietrich. So he, this man was, Michael Aquino was playing a huge role. He was well it's respected. Yeah. Um, he had a great deal of influence. Um, Let me ahead. give you an example of how, um, you, you, we were talking about the officers pushed out. We're talking about the chaplain's handbook, his influence on law. So we're going to get into all of this. So when it comes to the chaplain's handbook, to follow up on this, uh, he wrote the chaplain's handbook. He introduced the religions of Wicca and Satanism into the chaplain's handbook. And he um, said that they need to be recognized as the religions that the military uh, abides by, uh, just as valid as Christianity or Judaism. This was at a time before Muslim or Islam or Buddhism was really integrated into the military. You basically had Catholics, uh, Protestants and Jews, basically also Mormons, lots of Mormons. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was also introducing Wiccanism and Satanism. And he was pointing out that no matter what chaplains are on site, whether Mormon or a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic priest or a Protestant deacon, when the satanic chaplain shows up, everybody else has to step back and stand down. Uh, that's because the unofficial religion of the military is Satanism. For those of you who doubt, there's a documentary you can find on YouTube titled The Dark Side of Aldura. Aldura is spelled A-L space D-O-U-R-A. And The Dark Side of Aldura is about a U.S. Army Ranger. These are another elite of the U.S. Army, like the Green Berets. They used to be known as the Black Berets. And they would be the scouts. The Rangers would be reconnaissance in force, meaning these were like um, battlefield assassins. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this one young U.S. Army Ranger served in the Gulf War, We're well after Michael Aquino. This was a guy named, uh, I, I forget his uh, name exactly, but if you if you review The Dark Side of Aldora, 
you run across this tragic story. Needham, Needham. Uh, his surname was N E E D H A M. He took photographs of what the satanic chaplains in the U.S. Army were doing. He took photographs of the fact that they were cracking open young boys' skulls, only young boys. They didn't want the girls because they didn't want the estrogen. They were cracking open young boys' skulls and then taking out their brains to pass around for the troops to eat. This was the satanic consecration. And he was taking photographs of this, photographic evidence, and a photographic evidence of their skinning men alive, scalping their faces off. Uh, all of this is part of- Oh, that's of interesting, you know, when you think about that scalping the faces off with the incident in Peru recently. That is yes. fascinating. I wonder, if there's something, I wonder if there's something to that. That's, uh, there might not be, I don't know. That's just interesting. Well, yeah, anyway, it, it's yeah, it's an important point. Well taken. And understand that uh, John Needham was tortured mercilessly. When he reported to his officers, they basically targeted him, targeted him as a traitor. Uh, they uh, locked him up in a, uh, uh, a hot locker box in the desert sun until all his skin burned off. By the time they sent him home, he was so beaten and so crazed that his girlfriend, who was a nurse, uh, had to leave him. And uh, she said that he tried to kill her. And uh, of course, he picked up an ethnic girlfriend who had essentially no rights because she couldn't communicate in English very well. And he mm -hmm. killed her instead. Uh, and of course, like most troops, as I said, the judge just let him go. Just said, oh, well, he's a soldier. He's got post-traumatic stress disorder. He's not responsible for his actions. Just turned him into the care of his father. And uh, but then he wound up dying anyway. Uh, he, his dad was taking him for a walk along the beach like a dog. And it's like somebody pressed a remote switch. He just shut shut down. He just his heart stopped. He dropped and he died. Uh, very occult like. Now, in terms of this John Needham, the um, subject, the U.S. Army Ranger, who's the subject of uh, the dark side of Aldura, it opens up with uh, Cheney, Dick Cheney saying, we must go to the dark side. We must go to the dark side. Literally mm -hmm. him saying that. And all of this goes to show where your military is at now, what the satanic chaplaincy is doing. This is what it was doing in Iraq when John Needham was there. This is not something that is I'm I'm indulging myself in as some kind of fantasy. And, and to give you an example, how officers were pushed out who were not with the program at West Point at the time that I was dealing with all of this. The child daycare center building in West Point, where they train your army officers. This was building number 666. And at building number 666, the children were coming home. And you, uh, as I said, a military doctor forswears the Hippocratic Oath. He does not swear by it. He forswears it uh, because he needs to do damage as well as save lives. He needs to be able to develop biological weapons uh, and uh, needs to uh, be able to hurt the enemy as well as help his own troops. So military doctors are different. And at the same time, the kids who were coming home from building number 666 at West Point, most of their parents were U.S. Army doctors and nurses. That meant they were officers. These were officers, children. And they were coming home with chlamydia, uh, every STD you can imagine venereal diseases, and they were coming home with grievous injuries to their anuses and vaginas. People had shoved broken bottles up their uh, asses or their vaginal orifices and mm -hmm. baseball bats uh, mm -hmm. stretching their youthful genitalia all out of proportion. And of course, the doctors knew exactly what had happened. And they said somebody has raped our child with a broken bottle, with a baseball bat. And they were simply said, told, we'll bring in an investigator. And who came in? Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani was brought in to investigate. And Rudy Giuliani said, it's cool. It's cool. He said, everything happened in here, the kids did to themselves. He said, all these children broke bottles and shoved it up their own cunts and asses because they want attention. Oh, oh Mr. Mr. Dietrich, we have to really... Try to be careful with language. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, oh. Do understand, of course, uh, uh, the background, what I was dealing with on a daily basis, of course. Go uh, right ahead. Go right along. 
Yes. And so here's Rudy Giuliani saying it's all the kids fault. And he said they're just trying to frame a bunch of innocent uh, people on site. And uh, they're, uh, but it's really their parents are programming them to do this, and their parents have to be removed from the military. So the parents quit en masse. Many uh, U.S. Army doctors quit then. Many nurses quit then. Uh, and this was how John Henry Hagman got more and more control of the entire situation. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about all of this going down as one example. Another example is when uh, Michael Aquino was brought on trial with everything that I was exposing. Uh, he was finally brought to bear by a woman he considered his nemesis. She was Sandy Gallant. She was this blonde haired, blue eyed Nordic Aryan female who was an inspector in the San Francisco Police Department. I worked with her. She became famous because she had uh, warned of a body found in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. A headless body was found in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and in place of the human head was a chicken head. And everybody thought, what's this crime? She says, it's voodoo. This is Vajo Hudun's. And this is a ceremony in which the Bokor, the black magician, will come back and try to reanimate this body as a zombie. She said, mm -hmm. put it under armed guard. Everybody said, you're crazy, you're stupid. They laughed at her, but they put in armed guard. A uh, private security man, they didn't even bother with putting a real cop guarding the body. Well, that private security guard died defending that body. A whole gang of people broke into the coroner's office that night and tried to take the body. He fought them off and paid for it with his life, but they never got the body. And uh, so what happened was she had prevented the reanimation of a zombie. She became an expert consultant in occult crime after that. When Sandy Gallant began to investigate Michael Aquino because of what I was informing her about, she actually published a, uh, a police manual on occult crime. This, of course, was patented in ring binder form because police manuals, field manuals are all ring binders so they can take in and insert new kinds of instructions for the field every time new laws are imposed, every time new litigation is is become uh, the law of the land uh, and they have to know what to enforce. Other times laws are revoked and then they take the ring the binder. The ring binder because they're constantly yeah. adjusting Changing. Yeah. yeah, so this ring binder manual on occult crime, if you look for it on the internet, you'll find it, but you'll find it censored heavily. Uh, but uh, when she did this, people were going to seriously, all over the United States, departments at every level were seriously going to start investigating a cult crime. And Michael Aquino said, I've got to stop this. Well, he used a word I'm not going to use. <laughs> and so he sent his uh, running dog, Lieutenant Colonel James Channon, who was to retire as a full bird colonel. Now, James Channon was the man who was in charge of the 1st Earth Battalion. The 1st Earth Battalion declared themselves to be satanic warrior monks and they had a, their own academy of dark jedi that they called themselves they hadn't come up with the term sith yet and they called themselves the uh, satan's crusaders and their headquarters was in new mexico and uh, was paid for by u.s tax dollars and uh, this man, unlike Aquino, because Aquino was able to appear on Oprah Winfrey, he was able to appear on Geraldo Rivera and other shows only in his satanic regalia. He couldn't appear in full uniform because the U.S. Army told him, look, you're too controversial. We can't have you appearing in a military uniform. But James Channon could. And James Channon went all over the United States and he went to all of the federal uh, law enforcement agencies like the FBI, the big constabularies like Los Angeles Police Department. And everywhere he went, he said, look, if a Roman Catholic immigrant uh, robs a bank and they drop a saint's medallion on the floor of that bank, does that implicate the Catholic Church in that bank robbery? And of course, all the cops said, no, of course not. Of course not. That's ridiculous. 
So then he said, that means that when you find a headless body in a pentagram drawn in human blood, that cannot implicate the satanic church. And all the cops said, fine, let's work for us. So after that, they tore all of the manual out of the ring binders. All they the see how, that, that's hugely important. I mean, the logic, I mean, on paper, yeah. I mean, of course, that would make, but from that point on, that would insinuate that these incidences, if they did, if they did have any hint of um, Satanism involvement or that this was a ritual of some kind, that would be left out of it conveniently. Those little yes. aspects is what all of it. Worse yeah. than that, what the cops do is when they find a headless body inside of a pentagram drawn in human blood, they just hose it away. In other words, they enable the crime. This has given the a Satanist a 007 license to kill. Now, if you don't believe me, let me drive the point home. When I exposed everything I did and we took down. Who was the, the man who said that? One more, uh, uh, not sure. to, just to make sure oh, everybody knows. James man, Channon. James, James Channon. And just so people know, James Channon had liver spots under his eyes, big bags under his eyes that look like beef liver. His breath stank because you could smell his decaying liver from all the alcohol he drank. Mm -hmm. And he was portrayed in the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats by George Clooney. George Clooney played this guy up as a sex bomb. And yeah. and so this is the man who in The Men Who Stare at Goats is supposed to be the good guy. That's James Channon. The guy went all over the place and said, cops, you got to stop pursuing the churches. That's religious persecution. That's against the constitutional law because we have freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. All the way up to human sacrifice. And whoever doesn't believe me, dig this. So when I basically was a student at John O'Connell Vocational Institute, I majored in commercial illustration. Now, because I graduated early due to a GED and went to City College early because I was, you know, nanoplasma brilliant, mm -hmm. <laughs> I basically had a talent for illustration that enabled me to make money. Now, the big industry in San Francisco was pornography. It was mm -hmm. the adult entertainment capital of the world, aside mm -hmm. from Paris. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I was illustrating pornography before I was of age to purchase it. Mm -hmm. So when I was illustrating pornography, a lot of references I were used were photographs because this is how professional illustration is done. You use photographic reference. Mm -hmm. And the man who kept a lot of photographic references of naked children on site, the John O'Connell Vocational Institute, was a man named Gary Willard Hambright. He was the manager of the child daycare center. At the Priscilla oh, yes. Military uh, yes. Yeah. And Gary Willard Hambright was my commercial illustration instructor. So you had a guy who had all this child born. He kept on site San Francisco Unified School District property. That was ultimately how I got him taken down. Mm -hmm. You see, everything that was going on at the Presidio, when I was pointing out child trafficking, child rape, Everything that the FBI was trying to investigate there or other departments, they were oh. all thrown off by the U.S. Army. Right. The U.S. Army. Go on. Didn't you um, help Alex Jones to get into Bohemian Grove? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was at Sonoma State University. What happened was that I had been dispatched by the U.S. Department of Defense mm -hmm. as a spy to Sonoma State University because Sonoma State University, for whatever reason, uh, Sonoma State University was originally built as a woman's prison. And when the locals said, we don't want a woman's prison here, they said, fine, we'll make it a university. And um, so then what happened was after they made it a university, and believe me, it felt like a prison, uh, mm -hmm. what happened was that um, for some reason, John McLaughlin, Ted Koppel and a number of big time names in journalism funded Project Censored. And Project Censored was uh, journalism majors investigating the most censored stories in the United States and the world. 
Mm-hmm. And so somehow they investigated Harp and had found out details about Harp they weren't supposed to know. So they sent me into Sonoma State University for a year to try and find out how Project Censored was getting such information. Mm-hmm. So while I was at Sonoma State University, Ron Johnson and Alex Jones are quote unquote journalists. They show up and they say, hey, we're going up to Bohemian Grove to, you know, the kids who were supposed to be members of Project Censored. And uh, nobody wanted to go. And so I said, I'll go. And so I was driven up there with them. And uh, when we get to this Bohemian Grove, these idiots, Ron Johnson, uh, who wrote the book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, and uh, Alex Jones, who needs no introduction, but Mm -hmm. filters in later uh basically you've got these two goobers who are like running around sports jackets and it's not like they got any pliers to cut through razor wire or something like that or 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 gloves to protect them from electric shock from the fencing um so i said why don't you guys stop running around and i went to the gate and i said um tell michael aquino that um I'm here with a couple of guys who want to come into Bohemian Grove, a couple of journalists. And then the guard went to find Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino comes to the gate and says, oh, Doug. (laughs) He says, oh, let him in. And uh, both Ron Johnson and Alex Jones were just like zombies. They just saw him. And it's like he treated them like a couple of mindless robots. He Mm -hmm. was just he only talked to me. These guys to him just didn't exist. These were like, uh, you know, just a couple of fools. But he knew them. He knew who they were. And uh, what's that? We're going to have to continue this um, more. But we're not leaving yet. No, no, Um, not at all. I wanted to ask you if we could, maybe we should take some questions. Do you, I'll look at them myself. And I, but do you think... Do you want to take any questions from the chat? Oh, we can in a moment, but I do want to make some points clear first. Uh, okay. One of the points clear that I want to make is think about what I said about um, James Channon. And mm-hmm. also, it's important to remember that when um, Sandy Gallant, that uh, San Francisco Police Department inspector who could mm-hmm. have quit and become a career occult consultant, she uh, personally wanted to take a keynote down. The only person she could take down initially was Gary Willard Hambright because I was able to inform her, look, this guy's keeping child porn on site San Francisco Unified School District property. That's Mm -hmm. how the San Francisco Police Department was able to take him down off the base. You see, otherwise, if he were on base, he was protected by the army. Every time the FBI or other government agencies were trying to bust somebody on the base, the U.S. Army would cry jurisdiction and say, we've got our own criminal investigative division, the CID. And therefore, we say that you don't have jurisdiction to arrest this person or even to question them. So they couldn't get anything done on the base. And the only way to get one of them taken down was to get them off the base because I was able to prove that he had child born on site the school. And the reason he did so was because he didn't have a home. He was homeless. He effectively lived in a church because he was an ordained Baptist minister without a pulpit. So he was given a home in a church. But other than that, he didn't have a home. So he couldn't keep his child porn at that particular church. He kept it at the school where all the other teachers who were all male almost exclusively were perusing it. So when I was able to get him busted because he was not on the base, This is what took a member of the human child trafficking ring down. Understand that all the children who reported to Kino, thanks to my giving them the courage to do so, telling them to tell the authorities, uh, the FBI would take these children and the FBI would take them on rides through San Francisco. Understand that San Francisco is a city of hills. And this is why they film car chases in San Francisco. Everything from Bullet starring Steve McQueen to uh, The Rock with Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. All of this is filmed in San Francisco. Hollywood comes here to film its car chases. So you can confuse people easily by taking them on a San Francisco ride. And what the FBI would do is it'd take all these kids on a ride all the way around San Francisco and then take them by Aquino's house. 
And they all pointed to Aquino's house and said, that's the house in which they tortured us, raped us. And they would report that it has an all black living room. Everything inside is painted black. And they were taken to a torture chamber where no one could ever hear them scream. No, no matter how loud they screamed, nobody could hear them. And uh, so it was Michael Aquino who was identified. They said he was dressed as a woman. Gary Willard Hambright, the man I got taken down, was dressed as a woman. And the wife Lilith was dressed as a man. Now, when the yeah. children reported all this, eventually Inspector Glenn Pamphloff raided Aquino's home on Leavenworth Street, just walking distance from my Why own home. Why was that, do you think? Why was that? That they were cross-dressed? Was it to confuse, like, so the kids wouldn't be able to identify them so easily? Or what do you think it was? It was one of the factors. Uh, the other factor was that it's an inversion ritual. It's an inversion ritual where they're simply exchanging roles. Um, everybody was forced to call Gary Willard Hambright, um, Mr. Gary. They called Michael Aquino, Mikey. Um, Lilith was called Lily, I believe. But when the kids described all this, and then when Inspector Glenn Pamphloff raided Aquino's home, Everything the kid said was true. And he said they discovered the dungeon was soundproofed and it had blood all over the walls. And they would force to the kids to write their own names in their own fecal matter on the walls. So their names were dried in dried fecal matter all over the walls of this soundproofed dungeon. Why do you think uh, why were they doing this? Because it would degrade the children, just like the fact that they had a crucifix on the roof. This is when the police officer, Glenn Pamphloff, broke down crying when he was talking to me because obviously I was giving him a lot of information. And I said, um, what's so disturbing to you about the cross in the roof? And he said, because Aquino would point to it and tell the kids, see, God's looking down at you and he wants us to do what we're doing. That's why he's not helping you. And all and the kids came think, to. What would they do with these children, do you think? What the point of degrading them and getting to this point, but then would they... Oh, Where sexually assaulting them, programming them, programming them to abuse other people because the kids grew up in a world where there was no justice. Here's how. You see, when Sandy Gallant finally got Aquino on trial, well, with Gary Willard Hambright, I want people to know this about him. I say, I'll add two. I just yeah. want to add really quickly. Yeah. I have heard of this um, yeah. in several different SRA, yeah. you know, um, Satanic ritual abuse. Yes. Yes that they will oftentimes do these things and they will say, do you see how God can't, isn't helping, isn't yes. flashing yes. out of the sky and saving you. Yes. And there's this type, it's something that um, it, have, it, weigh, it weighs very heavily on the psyche of these children. Absolutely. Absolutely. They feel abandoned by God mm -hmm. and uh, they become Satanists as a result because God is not there for them, but Satan's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So when it came to Sandy Gallant and, uh, whoa, Gary Willard Hambright, when he was put on trial, he was federally indicted for sexually assaulting 14 children, all of them under four years of age. Mm -hmm. He would have been indicted for hundreds more if he hadn't died of AIDS while he was on trial. And it turned out he had infected, along with many other assailants, Half a thousand kids with AIDS at the Presidio military base. Oh, wow. That's crazy. They all died. Mm -hmm. 500 children. That's why the families all got together before the U.S. Army transferred them to East Germany and Korea and Okinawa and all over to the four edges of the earth. They all got together and burned the child daycare center to the ground. Then they demanded the records, and that's when the U.S. Army burned the record center to the ground. All of this happened within a span of months. During that time, Gary Willard Hambright died of AIDS, and these parents knew their children were going to die next. And you couldn't sue the U.S. Army in those days. And in terms of the Internet, there was no Internet, nothing to speak of per se, so they couldn't get their story out. When it came to uh, the um, uh, trial, when Sandy Gallant finally brought Michael Aquino on trial, he came into the court in full uniform and he had the full might of the U.S. Army behind him. 
And he said, I'm a member of the World Affairs Council. I have both national security clearances and international security clearances. Mm -hmm. And I'm not obligated to tell you anything. And he said, beyond that, I want you to change your laws so that you never bother me or any Satanist again. And so what California did was they said, okay, any child under the age of 18, their testimony is not allowed in a court of law. So think about what I just said. California's right. got one of the largest economies in the world, one of the largest populations in the world, and it's legal in California to rape a child, to kill a child, and if the child survives your murder attempt, if the child survives your rape attempt, if the child survives as your sex slave, your prisoner and escapes, all their testimony, if they're under 18 years of age, is dismissed. That's a legal fact in the state of California because of Michael Aquino. If you don't believe the Satanists run America now through your military junta, you're in complete denial. You're suffering cognitive dissonance. So with that, we'll turn towards some questions and, um, you know, whatever Jennifer Hawkins feels is uh, acceptable when she returns. Uh, in the meantime, I will um, express the fact that uh, I, uh, I appreciate being here. I, I didn't personally see anything uh, particularly negative in the chat, but I didn't really look. <laughs> and so I'm certain that our gang stalkers have followed us here, and I'm so glad that Jennifer stands up to them. Uh, she's one of a kind. Uh, you know, there's only few, a few people in the world willing to do that. And the fact that she rebounded so uh, so readily after that assault at the beginning of our um, interview tonight, uh, she's made of strong stuff. Uh, a great girl. I'll wait till she gets back. Uh, and um, so let's see what uh, Nemo is relaying a question. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go now, on. yeah, sorry. No, no we should. I think it'd be good to take some questions yeah okay let's look now i don't know if anybody has any questions but if you do have any questions that you'd like to um ask mr dietrich you'll want to put them in all caps please and um we'll start in order now, the last message I see right now is from Thomas Paine. It says, yes, it is. And Jay Milner, uh, hey, Jay, how are you? It says, um, fantastic job, great guest. So if any of you guys have any questions for Mr. Dietrich, um, go right ahead now. You can post them in all gaps, and I'll try to catch them. We'll see. Yes. By the way, Nemo in Australia says that he saw a question in the chat earlier. He's relaying it now. Um, uh, yeah, apparently what it says is, I'm um, going to try and ask this. There's a question from YouTube chat. He says, who of these kids escaped these horrors to grow up and become whistleblowers? Any, any books? Yeah, David Schurter, um, a good example of it. And uh, what happened was that David Schurter, his name is spelled S-H-U-R-T-E-R, uh, first name David, and uh, David Schurter was an individual who was taken into the tunnels, uh, kept as a sex slave of Michael Aquino for a while, was one of Aquino's favorites, and he wrote a book called The Rabbit Hole. So um, there you have that, David Schurter and The Rabbit Hole. I am uh, I never read it. Uh, I was told by... Um, oh. yeah. Go right ahead. Uh, there's I saw now that... Um, oh, please I relay it. Yeah. Mike says um, his question got blocked. Repost it, Mike. And then YY says she has two questions. Mm -hmm. So when you get finished with that, I'll have I'll answer these two things. Wait, sure. wait. Do you, do you, do you, okay. So YY most recent question I see is um, Mr. Dietrich, do you plan to document all these facts into a book? He has written some books. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean we're writing another book, but I do recommend everyone read the War, the Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II. You can also read Vampirology, um, that will give you the Soviet side of uh, certain things going on in World War II. We'll get more into the history with a revision and expansion, but I do want people to understand that it's a good overview of the Soviet perspective on 
vampire physiology. Um, when it comes to the um, uh, history of World War II on the American side in particular, uh, read the Roswell deception and the demystification of World War II, and you'll get a lot of details about your history to put things in further context. But we are now working on another book, which we're going to try and get out as soon as possible, which covers uh, a lot of the occult aspects of this. Uh, much um, of what yeah, I'm yeah. going, yeah, we're going to revisit this and I'm going to post, yeah. uh, Mr. Dietrich's books. Oh, thank you. In the description, you'll have to come back and check it. Cause I have to, we had to drop the first stream and I had to re-upload yeah. a new one. I didn't have time to put all of the details into the description, but when I do, I'll put links to his website, links to his YouTube channel. And then um, the books that he would like me to post on there as well, I will do so. He'll send it to me in the Skype message. I see here too, looking at this, um, Mike said, it's Troubled Minds. Uh, that's Mr. Strange. He says, according to Aquino's account at Midsummer 1975, Satan appeared and revealed that he wanted to be known by the true, by his true name, Set, mm -hmm. which had yes. been the name used by his worshipers in ancient Egypt. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, just to give people an idea of how uh, Michael Aquino uh, had um, uh, impressed the military high command uh, in the early days of uh, Vietnam, well, basically at the height of the war, uh, 1968, uh, the Americans were sending helicopters out with uh, stereo systems. You actually see this in the movie Apocalypse Now, but it's portrayed almost like the indulgence of a lone commander. In reality, you had entire units of helicopters dedicated to this task where they would play uh, supernatural noises, uh, the sound of ghosts, so to speak, to terrorize the Viet Cong at night. Of course, the uh, uh, helicopters are big, they make a lot of noise, and they have to come in close for you to hear music from their stereo system. So it's literally a rule of thumb that once a helicopter is larger than your thumb in your vision, you can take it down with a rocket propelled grenade. So the Americans were losing a lot of helicopters and expensive stereo equipment and uh, as well as the crews. And so they asked uh, Michael Aquino, what's your solution to this problem? And he uh, basically uh, went into a state of communion and channeled uh, any number of arch demons and channeled the Diabolicon. He wrote this book in a state of automatic writing, meaning that he was in a trance the whole time he wrote the book. And uh, the Diabolicon, you'll see bits of it published. You won't find a full edition. The full edition was actually kept at the Presidio military base under lock and key. It was uh, maintained in a uh, refrigerated safe. Uh, it was riddled with bullet holes. It had significant combat damage because the Vietnamese were considering it a military target and tried to destroy it several times. Uh, so they would attack the firebase in which Michael Aquino was stationed uh, in order to uh, destroy this book. Because with it, he was able to summon demonic voices from out of the aether, from out of the void, from out of the negative space uh, that um, is outside of our dimension. And literally, it had such force, these di diabolic voices, that they would knock the Viet Cong off their feet, knock them 20 feet away, throw them into the air and knock the, blow them 20 feet away whenever a diabolic scream would emit uh, as channeled per the spells, the rituals of Michael Aquino um, from his channeling of the Diabolicon. Uh, when it came to Satan appearing before him, uh, this is, um, as far as I can understand, true. And Satan, of course, was originally Seth N. Uh, that was the ancient god of plagues, pestilential foreigners, the desert, the anti-god uh, that uh, Horus fought over Cairo. Cairo's very name means the place of battle, the battle between Horus and Set. That's portrayed in the film Gods of Egypt, which the Temple of Set ran a campaign against so that everyone would riff on it, hate on it. And uh, you had this monumental blockbuster film that failed because the Temple of Set put out a campaign to uh, character assassinate the film. And they succeeded. 
Uh, but Gods of Egypt is really required viewing, and it's an excellent film. And it shows the defeat of Set by Horus, which the Temple of Set, of course, hates. And uh, understand that this is how the city of Cairo got its name, place of battle, between because of the battle between the both that took place there. It's now, of course, effectively the capital of Egypt. So when um, Michael Aquino uh, severed from the Church of Satan, there was another reason as well, far more pragmatic, far less romantic. And that was the fact that uh, Anton Zandor LeVay hated churches. One of the reasons he hated them was because they got fat tax breaks. And so he thought this was hypocritical and obscene. And so Anton Zandor LeVay proudly paid his taxes, proudly had the Church of Satan pay taxes. Well, Michael Aquino said, I don't want none of that tax crap. He says, I want the full, um, you, you know, uh, shall we say, um, uh, exemption uh, from taxes that churches get. And so he had his church, his schismatic church, the Temple of Set, registered as a church that was tax exempt. And uh, so that was another factor in his doing what he did. And, we'll get to uh, some more questions too. I just yeah. keep. I realized that what I'll do is I'll read the question and then come back here. <laughs> One second. Sounds good. Um. So, Allison Briscoe, and you can make this brief. But um, how did this affect your psyche? It's. <laughs> you know, like psyche. It, and, it, and, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, my soul. Yeah, basically, basically, the word psyche means soul. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's uh, and, uh, psychiatrically, psychologically, uh, I'm, 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 I'm warped. <laughs> I'm totally, I'm totally warped. It's, it's like, uh, uh, let me give you an example. David Scherter uh, describes in his book, The Rabbit Hole, uh, I like, I never read it from what I understand. It's almost like, um, uh, like a, it's almost like a work in, in gay sadoporn, like sadistic gay pornography. It is like you skim through the pages and it's like, you know, spike dildo, uh, blood, you know, etc. you know, rectal blood, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's just, it looks like something I really don't need uh, to reinforce what I already know. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the things that I advocated for was a tampon machine in the bathroom of the postal library on site, the Presidio military base. And uh, he, he, they finally installed one at my insistence and they never asked why, uh, but I was the only one that advocated for it. But uh, the reason I did was because so many of the kids would come in from the daycare center being taken to the library that were bleeding. And it was just something that uh, was an immediate way to provide them something to staunch the blood while I tried to call their parents and recommend their being taken someplace other than Letterman Army Medical Center where it was all going to be covered up. Right. So uh, the other this, yeah. I'm just going to give a couple of minutes for each question so we can get sure. to them. Unless yeah. some of them, because there's more to them than some of them. But this one, okay, uh, Troubled Minds, uh, Mr. Strange says, uh, does Mr. Dietrich believe Satan is real? Or is this simply devil worship LARPing with the temple from the temple of Set? Now understand one of the first things that the temple of Set and other Satanists will tell you is some other motive. They'll say it's LARPing, live action role playing. They'll say this is adult Dungeons and Dragons. Um, there is now a new Church of Satan called the Temple of Satan, I believe, or Satanic Temple. And their trip is, quote unquote, freedom of speech. And what they are claiming is that um, they're trying to prevent uh, church and state from being uh, forcibly reunited in such a way that we live under a religious tyranny. So what they try to say is that if Christians have the right to preach Christianity to children, that Satanists should also have that right. And they produce all kinds of books for children about how to sleep with animals, how to sleep with other children, how to sleep with adults, 
and this is like what they say are children's books, and they say this is all satire. They say this is satire because if Christians are bringing kids to Christian camps, then we can say that this is just as ridiculous, and what we're putting in your face is something to show you how ridiculous religious uh, proselytization is using federal funding. So then they try to get federal funding for their Baphomet statue and all that. All of this, of course, is a complete and total lie. It's the facade for a very real satanic church that is truly proselytizing to children. So these churches are quite real and these entities are quite real. But do understand the misunderstanding concerning many of these uh, entities and um, give me just a minute to explain this because it's important. Mm -hmm. Understand that um, one thing I learned from taking care of my parents for the last 10 years of their lives, I got a, med a medical education the wrong way. And the one thing I learned from almost 10 years of working with Michael Aquino was I got a theological education the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So what I can tell you is that good things happen to bad people for good reason. That when it comes to these children suffering and God's not intervening to help them, all this suffering ultimately, in a very real sense, sources from the creator, from the divine. And it does that because the creator created an ecosystem. And the ecosystem requires everything to cycle. So understand that when you're looking at everything you love in the universe, all of our universe, the majority of our universe is dark matter. All of this emptiness, the vacuum in space, all this blackness, so that a few flickering candles we call stars, these nuclear atomic furnaces that make life possible. Well, of that, a little bit of that material has gone out of gaseous nature into a more solid matter to become planets on which we live. So these terrestrial planets, the terrestrial planet on which we exist is such a small infinitesimal part of the rest of the universe. So much dark matter, so much emptiness, so much of a void for a world to hold life on it. And on that world, you have rainbows and puppies and flowers and everything you love. All of that, in turn, depends on dark things happening that you don't see. These flowers that blossom out of the soil are dependent on fecal matter being processed by dung beetles and carrion feeders under that soil, earthworms and dark animals you never want to see. Dark animals that if you played with, if you had, say, for instance, a compost pile, you don't go playing around in a compost pile or allow your children to do so because you'd contract a ringworm or an infection. But these animals in that compost pile in the under the ground, they're necessary for those blossoms above the ground that you so appreciate. So understand that this is the purpose of the devils and the demons. The devils and the demons are there to torment you. They're there to taunt you. They're there to corrupt you. They're there to ultimately entice and seduce you and drag you down. But those souls that are damned, they are composting. They're recycling. They're not irredeemable. They may be down there for what feels like an eternity, but they're serving a purpose. And their composting is what makes what we appreciate in life in this dimension possible. So understand that in their own way, the devils and demons are doing God's work. Without them, we wouldn't have what we appreciate of creation. They are an essential, integral part of it as much as any of the carrion feeders. Without flies feasting on cadavers, we would be immersed in cadavers. Without these uh, animals that uh, are hyenas, vultures, all the rest of those that take care of the waste products of our world, we would be mired in filth. So understand that the devils and demons are there for you. And understand this, what Michael Aquino and his cult are affiliated with, what they worship, are Edomic. These are anti-godly forces. These are entropic entities that seek the dissolution of this creation, of this universe. They seek ultimately the destruction 
of the devils and the demons as well as the angels. These are the equivalent of industrial waste. Unlike the regular human or animal fecal matter or waste products, uh, plastics and industrial chemicals and industrial uh, radiation, all of these radioisotopes or chemical pollutants unleashed into our environment serve no purpose. They only destroy, they poison, they warp and they mutate. These are the entropic entities, the anti-gods, which Aquino and his ilk worship. Uh, these um, are the anti-gods that, trust me, the yeah. devils and demons will side with you against. This includes the fell angels such as Lucifer will stand by your side to fight against this threat. That's amazing. Um, I'm, I had to look at the chat again. I want to say hello to James, a Salcedo Paranormal. That's a on this that's on the radio station too um then uh mr strange then retype the question not in caps for some reason because i asked for caps in case there were a lot of questions but it's just a few questions so uh just write it normally then i don't know if yeah please just write it normally and just uh that's fine because i thought that you know it's better to have them in caps so you can see them out of the whole chat instead of that way you don't miss any but if it's going to mess it up then just please go ahead and type it uh, normally yeah. and then um let me see here and then exiled minds podcast is here now exiled mind podcast is also on the radio station it's, he says it doesn't say but it's connected to hotels getting sued for trafficking mostly in florida that's an interesting thing i'm not sure what i missed the first top reference because i can't look at mm -hmm. the whole thing but mm -hmm. oh good okay i did ask it so it was the question about um you know are they do they really believe in these entities or is there a deeper, you know, the same you know, how, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, when I was a mercenary in Africa, uh, the Horn of Africa region, uh, East Africa, um, what I ran into in those cultures was that they understood demons to be agents of retributive justice, that um, in that sense, you, you don't find many gods of mercy in Africa, not in the shamanistic or original nativist religions. You do find, however, gods of vengeance. And uh, maybe not all gods are of vengeance. There's gods of fertility and other gods. But demons are recognized as uh, agents of potential retributive justice that can be recruited to your cause. Just want to bring that up as a different cultural perspective. It's not necessarily one I'm recommending, but just so people understand that there's different cultural understandings or perceptions of demons where they can consider them almost as a friend or at least an ally. Mm -hmm. uh, I want more people to grasp that concept considering the threat we're truly facing from what the Temple of Set and the cults of the Kings of Edom are bringing into our world. With that, I'll go back to Jen and her questions. I'll go look and see if there's any more questions. You guys, please ask any questions you might have if you have any. Let me see, David asks this one. Does, um, do you know anything about MK Ultra victims and the connections there? MK uh, Ultra? Yes, yes. Well, by the way, a uh, uh, house is going for sale here in San Francisco that was an MK Ultra house where they, uh, program Charles Manson and a number of other celebrities. Uh, so uh, it's selling for millions of dollars, uh, something like 14 million. Um, look up the uh, MK Ultra House selling in San Francisco, and uh, you'll get an idea of just how familiar I am with MK Ultra. Uh, obviously, what I saw was MK Ultra in action. And uh, I do want people to understand that a good example of this is um, someone like David Scherter um, hates my guts. And um, he hates my guts because he feels that when I showed up on the scene, Aquino stopped paying attention to him. Yet he'll write in his book, and I'm not coming down on him, but he'll write in his book how he witnessed Michael Aquino skewer infants, babies, roast them on an open spit and eat them. Um, you're talking about a guy who's witnessing this level of, of abuse, and yet he feels somehow cheated that Michael Aquino stopped abusing him uh, when I showed up on the scene because Michael Aquino found me so compelling or attractive. This is something that is 
an example of MK Ultra. <laughs> this right. is this is the you know so um, it's all uh, connected to MK Ultra because it's all tied. Yes. Um. Yes. Another question. Let's see. Um. Hindus hotels phone trafficking ad lawsuit. Um. So, exiled pot, mind pot, exiled minds podcasts again. He ref he's talking about um hidden doors in hotels found. And, uh, you know, these hotels might have been trafficking down Florida, about human, about the children trafficking. And then YY asked, um, who of these kids escaped these horrors to grow up and become whistleblowers? Any, any books? So have any of these kids that escaped these horrors, if they did, have they grown up to become whistleblowers or any, write any books that you're aware of? In, in, most of them are left so incoherent, so mentally ravaged by what happened to them that they really don't have the capacity to communicate. David Schurter is an example of writing his book, The Rabbit Hole, of an exception to the rule. But if you were to speak to him personally, um, I would wager that you would probably find him fairly incoherent or probably could not follow him for too long. He probably his company would be very hard to keep. Uh, most of these people are so damaged that they're effectively uh, desocialized and therefore cannot uh, express their victimization. Here's a good example. When Michael Aquino was on Oprah Winfrey, there was a young man who came up from the audience and said that Michael Aquino abused me. And he said right there in front of God and everybody, uh, national television with Oprah Winfrey holding a mic to his face, Michael Aquino made me kill people. He said, Michael Aquino made me uh, commit crimes. And of course, uh, then they focus the camera on Michael Aquino and you can see Michael Aquino just moving his lips. Like, um, basically the first thing Michael Aquino did is he challenged the young man. And of course, from his position of authority and power, nobody could fight back. Here's why. He just said quite logically, why didn't you call the police? And so here's this young man who's just confessed to murder. And Michael Aquino throws it back on him. Why didn't you call the police? Well, he can't call the police. You <laughs> because he would be arrested for murder, <laughs> which you made him commit. As Michael Aquino used to say, I use stupid people the way stupid people use guns. But then when the young man was trying to explain where this happened, because Oprah Winfrey says, where did it happen? Then the camera actually turned towards Michael Aquino and you see his lips move and he's looking at the young man. He's saying he doesn't remember. You see him mouth it. He doesn't remember. He doesn't remember that. Then the boy who sees that, he goes, I don't remember. And so he's made to look like a fool making up stories. Mm -hmm. So you see what these people are facing. What they're facing is a programming that compartmentalizes their experiences so that when somebody earnestly questions them, they're unable to back up their stories. This is part of the programming which disables their ability to write a book. Say they're trying to talk to a co-author. Say somebody sits down and says, OK, I'll help you write a book. They're, they're unable to get it out in such a fashion that this person can work with because the person's going to wind up saying, you know what? I'm going to wind up getting sued for slander, mm -hmm. for defamation of character. Right. So I can't can't do this without evidence. And so you're going to have to tell me where you killed this person, at which point the person's going to be guilty of murder themselves and they're going to go to jail. So then they have to shut down. You see what I'm saying? That's This is what happens. This is why you don't get what you got with David Schurter. He's the exception that proves the rule. Um, there may be others. And when they happened, there was a man who wrote, um, uh, he was in the Navy. He was in the U.S. Navy and he wrote a book about Satanism. For those of you who don't know, by the way, uh, there was a satanic funeral held in San Francisco when Anton Zandor LaVey established the first Church of Satan. It was for a U.S. Navy sailor. This was showed you then already the influence over the military. So when a sailor wrote a book about being a Satanist in the Navy, um, he wound up being character assassinated. They forced him to ultimately retract what he said. Um, 
the reason that um, yeah, I'm so suppressed, anybody who's with us tonight, understand you are privileged. I'm banned off Facebook. I'm not allowed a Wikipedia page. I am somebody who this courageous young lady, Jennifer Hawkins, has done her best to interview, and they did their damnedest to stop her from doing so tonight. Believe me, this was a technical assault on multiple levels. My side, her side, and that was pretty something. intense. I will yeah. say that that was like my I had to I had to go get uh, I had to go I had to shut everything down and then yeah. I contacted Mr. Strange and I was like I don't know and we did get it sorted out because it was something to do it was it was I don't know I had to reboot but, but everything. Ultimately, I, had to, I will tell you whatever it was. Ultimately, it was a combination of NSA and the occult. Don't think that that could happen on your side, my side. Was Remember, I was hearing all the echoes. You yeah. know, like yesterday we did it and it was perfectly fine. And then it seemed like it was going to be fine. And then it yeah. was just, it was unbelievable. But um, El Nemo asked in the chat too, um, did did Anton LaVey ever realize that Michael Aquino was a spy basically, or that he was infiltrating it on purpose? Yes, yes, he did. And that's ultimately why he severed, why they, a part of their severance. Um, uh, Anton Zandor LaVey did. Now, I do want to emphasize something to people. Anton Zandor LaVey was not a good guy. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people try to think of him as just this kind of positive Satanist as opposed to Michael Aquino. And that, that's just absurd. Uh, so, you know, we can go into the details of that another time, but I just want yeah. to toss that out there. Let me see. Please post uh, your questions. It didn't have to be all in caps. I just said that because I thought it'd be easier to catch them, but that's going to just, they'll, they're not posting if they're in caps. So just write them normally. Um, By the way, as Brendan points out, Brendan entered a little comment into our text box here. He said, the original ancient Greek word, daemon, uh, did not carry negative connotations as it denotes a spirit or divine power. The Greek conception of a daemon notably appears in philosophical works of Plato, where it describes the divine inspiration of Socrates. So understand that the Greeks had a term eudaimonia. EU means good, like eugenics means breeding up, good breeding. So eudaimonia meant that you were in high spirits. Uh, so um, just some further context there. Now, hopefully people don't get the idea that I'm promoting my own form of Satanism or De, de uh, diabolatry. The term would be diabolatry, the worship of devils and demons. It's not what I'm doing. Uh, right. what, what I'm implying is that you have to understand this is an ecosystem and that without elements of the ecosystem, creation collapses. The ecosystem collapses when elements are taken away. Um, if you were to get, destroy uh, termites or ants, as horrible as they are, and I don't like either species, uh, it would impact our ecosystems profoundly. Certainly, we appreciate honeybees because we like what they produce, <laughs> but uh, there's other species that uh, are just as valuable or integral. Um, yeah, so any other questions you might find, Jen, by all means. Let me see if they did post any more. Sure. Do you guys have any more questions at all? Otherwise, I'm going to I'll ask him. I'll ask you a couple of questions myself because sure. or we'll just get back to talking just a little while and then sure. I probably better. You know, get myself. Around to probably, you know, to resting. Yeah, then, of um, course. But I want to.